What does it mean to be human? Why are we here at all in the first place? Why is there a universe? You will never answer those questions from within a logical scientific framework. The answers come to us from mythology. The right brain works in images where we get messages in our dreams. Jeffrey Mishlove's journey began in 1968, sparked by a powerful dream. Despite academic taboos, he earned a doctorate in parapsychology. So did Susan Blackmore, by the way. Jeffrey's theories, like Arthur Young's reflexive universe theory, proposes a hierarchical structure of evolution suggesting untapped human growth. Now, how does Jeffrey reconcile that with evolutionary understanding? We explore that. In studying consciousness, he adopts some active observer approach, attempting to integrate scientific objectivity with an experiential understanding. So it's not science per se, and it's not meditative per se. One discussion involves a psychic predicting UFO sightings, including a widely witnessed event. How can such claims be objectively verified? Again, we explore that. On the personal development side, Jeffrey emphasizes the importance of what he calls a strong ego prior to spiritual growth, warning against prematurely sacrificing ego, which can lead to being stuck in a state of quote-unquote false enlightenment. This podcast had several editing challenges on both the audio and the video front, particularly with mine, as we just didn't have it. I don't know if you've seen the podcast of myself being interviewed by Ryan Graves on the Merged podcast, but what he did was he resurrected with AI the episode, at least with the audio side. We had to cobble something together in a similar manner, and it'd be a shame to not release it. What you're witnessing is akin to a classified episode that's finally being uploaded. My name's Kurt J. Mungle, and this podcast is called Theories of Everything, where we explore theories of everything from a physics perspective primarily, though I'm dipping my toes more and more, so to speak, into consciousness studies. And attempting to decipher the hard problem of consciousness, as well as what role does consciousness have on either engendering or supervening on the laws of physics. Enjoy this hitherto unreleased podcast with Jeffrey Mishlove, the creator of New Thinking Aloud. Link in the description to that. All right, Jeffrey Mishlove, welcome to the Theories of Everything podcast. Could you kindly unwind your journey into the realm of parapsychology? As I've been reflecting on it, I realized that probably my first introduction to this world of the paranormal and the esoteric began in 1968, even a few years before I I had some powerful dreams that really changed my life. But the stage was set in 1968 when I was an undergraduate student uh, attending summer school at the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. And I remember I was sitting in the cafeteria one afternoon and a man walked up to me, handed me a flyer, and I looked at the flyer. It said, Spiritual Science a lecture on spiritual science. And at that moment, I felt like a current of electricity running up and down my spine. I'd never seen those two words juxtaposed like that, spiritual science. And uh, it turned out the lecture was about uh, the Austrian mystic, Rudolf Steiner, and his the movement he had founded called Anthroposophy. So I attended the lecture. I got to meet people in the anthroposophy community. And as a result of that, I went back for my senior year in Madison at the University of Wisconsin, and I elected to write a senior thesis on the psychology of religious mysticism. And really, I went into it as a skeptic. I thought there must be some psychopathologies associated with people who think that they're having mystical experiences. Uh, Freud had already described this as kind of a return to an infantile state of consciousness and people who thought they saw ghosts. So I'd, I'd write it up that way. But the more I researched it, the more I came to realize that mystics were some of the most important people in our culture. And in fact, I, I got in touch with the work of Abraham Maslow, a psychologist who wrote the book Toward a Psychology of Being, in which he had interviewed some of the most important people in our culture in his era, people like Albert Einstein and Eleanor Roosevelt. And he found that they all 
report what he called peak experiences that were central to their lives. And also he added these peak experiences are indistinguishable from mystical experiences. So with that understanding, I could no longer feel comfortable debunking the paranormal and, and the esoteric. But then I went on to graduate school in criminology at Berkeley. And it, it was some four years later in 1972 that my great uncle Harry visited me. That's the best way I can describe it. He visited me in a dream, literally at the moment of his death. And that dream was so powerful that I, I woke up from the dream and I was just crying tears of joy and singing a, a very sacred song from my religious background. And I wrote home. I said, how's it, Harry? I had a dream about him. And my mother called me as, as soon as she got my letter. She said, how did you know Uncle Harry just died? Uh, that really shook me up. It made me realize something's going on here that I don't understand. And I asked for an object of Uncle Harry, something he had owned, so I could think of him and remember him. I was sent a, a little book, and, and I was told this was Uncle Harry's favorite book. It was a book written in Yiddish, a very obscure language that European Jews spoke. It's kind of a uh, written in the Hebrew script, but the language is more like German. And I had to get it translated. I realized after having it translated for me that it was called The Tales of the Baal Shem Tov, who was the founder of the Jewish Hasidic movement in the 18th century. It was a very powerful, mystical movement within Judaism. And it was then that I came to realize that my great uncle Harry had been a mystic. I had always known that he was a very religious man, a pious person, an Orthodox Jew. But now I was introduced to the, the mystical side of Judaism. And as a result of that contact, I felt that I had to change my my trajectory, my uh, career trajectory. I had to move away from criminology. At the time, I was doing volunteer work at, at San Quentin Prison, working with murderers and rapists and um, the psychiatric unit, doing group therapy with them. And, and I made a decision as a result of the dream with Uncle Harry that I was going to switch. Somehow, I would find a way to see the positive side of human deviance rather than the, the negative, that I would be studying intuition, creativity, mysticism, psychic phenomena, the esoteric and occult. And I didn't, of course, have any idea as, as to how this could be done. There weren't any programs of this sort at the University of California, which is a large major university. So I anguished about this for months, trying to figure out what am I going to do? And one day, in, if I recall correctly, it was probably November, probably about six months after the Uncle Harry dream, when I had another dream. And not only did I have another dream, but I knew in advance that I was going to have a dream that evening. I just, it was a knowing, an intuition. And I knew that uh, the answer to all my searching was going to come to me in a dream that evening. So I, I was ready for it, you might say, after, after months of anguish. And I did have a dream. I uh, woke up. I was exhilarated. I knew I had found the answer in the dream, but I didn't know what the what it meant. The dream in in the dream, I was visiting friends in Berkeley, people I knew well. Knocked on the door of their apartment in married student housing. 
no answer. And in the dream, I found a key, let myself into their apartment, walked into the living room where I found right in the middle of the living room floor, a magazine in the dream called I, E-Y-E. And I'm paging through the magazine. And then I woke up with this feeling like, that's it, I have the answer. But of course, I had no clue. So I acted out the dream. I put on my tennis shoes, ran five miles across town, came to this apartment, knocked on the door as I had dreamt, no answer. And in fact, I knew that they kept the key under the doormat. So I picked up the key, entered the apartment, walked into the living room, and there, smack dab in the middle of the living room floor, just as I had dreamt, was a magazine. And this is an example, I suppose, of a dream distortion. It wasn't called I, it was called Focus. And it was the magazine of listener-sponsored radio and television in the San Francisco Bay Area, KQED. And I'm paging through the magazine when it dawned on me for the first time in my life that I could pursue my interests if I got involved in the nonprofit, non-commercial segment of the media. So because I lived in Berkeley, I went over to the Pacifica radio station there, which is also nonprofit, uh, KPFA, and said, I'd like to volunteer. And at that point, I had already earned my my master's degree in criminology, but they said, here, sit down at this desk, and when you hear the doorbell ring, push this button so people can get in the front door. And I gladly did that. Uh, at the same time, I learned how to produce a radio program. I produced a program called You Don't Have to Be From Out of Town to Be Psychic, because I knew a lot of psychic friends in Berkeley, and I interviewed them. And the program director liked it so much, he said, we have a regular slot for you every Tuesday and Thursday at noon. Uh, we want you to host a program called The Mind's Ear. So within a few weeks of this dream, I found myself sitting across a table from world-class experts in all the areas that interested me the most. People on book tours passing through San Francisco came by that radio station with a very powerful signal, and I would be interviewing them with 10,000 people listening in. So that gave me the confidence to go back to the university where I was still a graduate student in criminology and switch over taking advantage of a very obscure program they had, the individual interdoctoral major program where if you want to do a, a dissertation, if you're already a graduate student in good standing, which I was, and you want to work in a field where no department will sponsor you, but you can find three faculty members from different departments who will each sponsor you. You can create your own unique degree program. So that would have been 1973 by then. I entered that program and uh, stayed in it until I graduated with a doctoral degree in parapsychology in 1980. And to this day, 43 years later, I'm not aware of uh, any other example of an accredited university issuing a doctoral diploma that says parapsychology on it. May, maybe I'm mistaken, but I always have to point out there are truly hundreds of people who have done dissertations, doctoral level dissertations on parapsychological topics they just done it within departments that were willing to sponsor them. Typically, their degrees were in psychology or philosophy or education, something like that. Why did you choose an academic approach to studying the paranormal? And how can one apply the scientific method in this field? I could have um, pursued it as a hobby, which I suppose I had up until 
uh, that point, but I was very serious. I wanted to get to uh, what had actually happened when I had this powerful dream of my great uncle visiting me. It's the most powerful dream I've ever had in my life. And, and I'm 76 years old. So, uh, you know, if you have one dream like that in your lifetime, it, it can change you dramatically. And it was so profound. I felt that it was worth devoting the rest of my life to studying it. And, and i I, I guess you would have to say I'm an intellectual person. I, uh, I've always enjoyed knowledge, and uh, I've always felt very comfortable in a university environment, even though uh, universities in general have, have not welcomed studies in, in this field. I mean, that's why 43 years later, no other degrees in parapsychology have ever been awarded. There, there is a taboo against it within academia. And to be honest, I had to fight very hard. The closer I got to completing my doctoral program at Berkeley, the more obstacles were thrown at me. And I had to, you know, overcome each and every obstacle. And then even after I received my degree, the organized groups of people who call themselves skeptics but are really scoffers, in, in my view, tried to pressure the university to revoke the degree, uh, nearly succeeded. One dean put it to me very starkly. He said, universities do not offer degrees in parapsychology, period. So they tried to undo it, and I had to fight a legal battle, uh, which I prevailed in, uh, and, and then another legal battle because uh, I, I had been libeled after they failed to get the degree revoked. Uh, an article appeared in Psychology Today magazine claiming that maybe the degree hadn't really been awarded at all, but if it had been awarded, it certainly wasn't deserved, and, and I fought a, a libel battle uh, at that point, six years of uh, legal wrangling, uh, which ended favorably for me. So uh, my passion has been the intellect. My approach has, has been intellectual. I think that um, you can approach the paranormal in many different ways. Some people are more heart-centered, I suppose you could say. And I think that's all very important. But uh, for me, understanding What's going on intellectually has, has been at the heart of my quest. And, uh, of course, being on uh, non-commercial radio where I started and now YouTube where I have a channel and uh, before that on national uh, television, public television or, around the country, it's it's always been my desire to share what I've learned intellectually with the public at large. Whose insights have been particular in shaping your understanding of parapsychology? That's a very difficult question to answer. Who is the most impactful guest? Because when I do the interviews, it's very much about being in the here and now, being fully focused and present with, with whomever I'm with. So each time I'm with somebody, they are the most important person. Uh, but if I look back, I, I would say that uh, starting in, in the, the very early work that I did, there were people who became very important mentors for me, who were also guests on uh, the early programs that, that I did. One such person was Arthur M. Young. Uh, who was a really crucial person in, in my development. He's the founder of, of a, the what was then called the Institute for the Study of Consciousness. He was a cosmologist, the author of many books, The Reflexive Universe, The Geometry of Meaning, The Bell Notes. He was also, when I say The Bell Notes, that was about his work with Bell Aircraft because Arthur Young was the inventor of the Bell helicopter, the very first commercially licensed helicopter. And uh, after he invented the helicopter, he uh, felt that he had earned the right 
to delve into philosophy. He, he felt that in, in his era, all of philosophy had failed to really anticipate and grapple with the rise of science and technology in the 20th century. And that if you really wanted to be a philosopher worth your salt, you first had to demonstrate that you could master a difficult technological problem. And so he set out in, uh, when he graduated uh, from Princeton in 1926, as I recall, he set out to find a problem that he could solve. He went to the patent office in Washington, D.C., and he discovered there had been 200 attempts to build or to design an aircraft that could hover in midair. And he realized it hadn't been accomplished yet. He would work to try and accomplish it. So between 1926 and the uh, first Bell Aircraft Model 47 in 1947, he worked for nearly 20 years uh, on the helicopter problem, only to prove that he would then be worthy to be a philosopher. And uh, at that point, he got into cosmology. He was deeply interested in psychic phenomenon and astrology. He had the means to travel the world and examine every interesting e example uh, in his era of psychic functioning and created a journal, the Journal for the uh, Study of Consciousness and uh, opened up this institute in Berkeley where he invited me and my good friend, Saul Paul Sirag, to move in and, and become his direct students. So uh, at the same time that I entered my parapsychology program, I had this remarkable gentleman as a, a mentor, a person of vast knowledge and who, who had developed what you are promoting, a theory of everything, Arthur Young's uh, reflexive universe is a theory that encompasses all of the sciences and mythology and our deep knowledge of esoteric functioning and paranormality and, and addresses what you could call first principles in philosophy, which are the most difficult of, of all to address. So he, he was a very wonderful man and a great influence on me. Another very important early influence uh, person who I interviewed was Gene Houston, the uh, psychologist who had founded a mystery school, something that was a, a modern version of uh, the ancient teachings of uh, the Eleusinian mysteries. And uh, again, this was an effort to educate people about the world's great spiritual traditions. And uh, Jean had an exquisite sense of humor. Her father was a professional humorist who uh, wrote for uh, people like Sid Caesar and uh, many, many of the great uh, comics in the early years of, of television. So Jean had a fabulous ability to invoke um, a theatrical presence. She actually based a lot of her work on the uh, theatrical uh, techniques of uh, Stanislavski, the, the idea of uh, a, an actor embodying the character that, that they become in the theater. And uh, that was her approach into, into the paranormal. And it was incredibly profound and exhilarating at the same time. I give you one example. When I attended Jean Houston's mystery school on one occasion, she was giving a lecture on the Hebrew Kabbalah based on the writings of um, a early 20th century Kabbalist, Carlos Suarez, who had written a book called The Cipher of Genesis. And she was explaining to the group using Kabbalistic principles, how it was that God created the world. In Hebrew, 
the sentence is Bereshit bara Adonai et Hashemayim viet Ha'aretz, which translated means in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the Kabbalistic idea is if you go through the Hebrew words letter by letter, and understand the meaning of each letter, because each letter is also a word and has a meaning, uh, that you will understand the very process by which the universe was created. And as she was lecturing, I felt like I got it. I understood at a deeper level this impulse of God to create a universe. And I thought it was the funniest thing in the world. Actually, it struck me as nothing could be more hilarious than God creating the universe. And I was literally rolling on the floor laughing and, and tears are coming down my eyes. And uh, Jean Houston noticed this and, and she came up to me and winked and, and said, oh, you're having an epiphany. huh?" And she understood that she had an enormous gift and still does. She's a great teacher, still alive, working today. An enormous gift to engender moments of spiritual awakening in the people with whom she works. She understood it, I think, as a psychological process, that there were psychological techniques available to all of us to awaken a deeper sense. She used to say, for example, that the human organism is incredibly exquisite. It's like a Stradivarius violin, but most people only learn to play it as if it were a plastic fiddle. But you could learn. You could learn to work with your organism to achieve something more like a, a concert violin. And so uh, that had just an enormous impact on me as, as I began my work. Those, those are two of the most influential people in my life. What's the reflexive model of the universe? Arthur Young's model of the reflexive universe starts with the idea of spirit descending into matter. And it goes through four stages as it descends into matter. It, you could say it starts out at the level of the photon, which uh, in his view is pure spirit, pure light. And uh, God said, let there be light in the beginning, uh, so to speak. And then from the photon, we get particles, typically uh, po positrons, uh, electrons, and protons. So you have positive and negative charge that comes next. And he saw that as being equivalent to the development of emotion, attraction, and repulsion, that emotions come. And then you get, after you have particles like that, you get atoms. Atoms for him represented form, form intellect. So emotion comes before intellect. And then intellect evolves with the very first atoms. And uh, of course, from atoms, we get molecules. And, and molecules, um, the most important molecules would be DNA and RNA, the molecules of life itself. Now, that's a turning point because at that point, with the development of DNA, RNA molecules, consciousness is already embedded in matter. But then matter itself evolves. You, you get the uh, single-celled organisms, you get plants, you get animals, you get the human kingdom. So uh, there's a, a turning point, the descent of spirit into matter, and then the ascent of spirit from matter back to spirit. And, and it's the evolution then of the human being towards what you might think of as a spiritually evolved being. Uh, his system is very complex. It incorporates, you could think of it as the periodic table of the elements in chemistry, but applied to everything, the periodic table of, of everything. And in that periodic table, he would say, the modern human being stands in relationship to, 
who we become, our potential as a fully realized human would be equivalent. And you could see it all laid out in these charts of his to where a clam stands in relationship to the animal kingdom. In other words, uh, if a human being, if as an animal, if we represent the uh, epitome of what an animal can become, then we are like clams as as far as the possibilities for being human, that there's so much growth uh, uh, available to us, untapped potential. How should we conceptualize consciousness within this model? Well, Arthur Young had a view that um, would be consistent with the idea that he called the great chain of being, which does represent a hierarchy, that uh, you have uh, animals being more evolved than plants, for example, because they have the quality of mobility that plants uh, don't have, and humans more evolved than animals, and some humans more evolved than than other humans. Uh, so it was very hierarchical in that sense. And I will say that I had another mentor, Dean Brown. I had the great pleasure of introducing them at one time, Arthur Young and Dean Brown. Dean was a physicist. He he had worked with Einstein at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, and he also became a good friend and a mentor, a, a, a great student of the world's religious traditions. He published a book of his translations of the Upanishads, for example, and he differed with Arthur Young on this idea of hierarchy. He said that there's no reason to think animals are more evolved than plants. It could be the other way around. After all, the plants get the animals to do their work for them, such as distributing their seeds and, and so on. That It might be that plants are a higher life form than, uh, than animals, which gave me uh, an appreciation for the fact that uh, you, you can often see things for, for every supposed truth that you might come upon. There could be an equal and opposite truth looking looking in the other direction. It's a, a particularly valuable lesson, I think, in when it comes to the world of politics, where people get very, very locked into particular ways of, of looking at the world. So uh, I've often found for myself, at least, it's very useful to have a flexible mind, a way of seeing things uh, from... Uh, both perspectives. I sometimes tell myself, uh, you want to be the lawn and the lawn mower at, at the same time. It's it's good to uh, understand both the ups and the downs of, of life. What is archetypal synchronistic resonance? It was, I believe, in 2007 that I uh, published an article co-authored with uh, Brendan Angen. It was published in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology and called Archetypal Synchronistic Resonance. Uh, the story begins many, many years before that. I guess I would take it back to my early years uh, in television, uh, in the original Thinking Aloud public television series. I interviewed uh, Marty Rossman, a medical doctor in Mill Valley, California, who was a specialist in hypnosis. And he was going to introduce me to the idea of getting in touch with your inner healing advisor. So uh, I, we recorded this. The whole thing is on video where, where Marty Rossman is hypnotizing me. And he's saying, and now your inner healing advisor will appear. And in my mind, I saw a man approaching me wearing a toga. And I thought to myself, hmm, I'd like to improve my public speaking abilities. So I'd like this inner healing advisor to be Demosthenes, the great Greek orator who could help me with my speaking abilities. and. As this in individual approached me in my mind, and I'm expecting now to have a conversation with Demosthenes, 
he said to me, I'm not Demosthenes. <laughs> I said, well, who are you? He said, I'm Seneca. <laughs> and I didn't know much about Seneca. It's a name you hear, you know, some ancient person, a poet, a playwright, a philosopher. I knew very little about Seneca, but I asked him in this hypnotic experience, well, now that you're here and you're Seneca, you're my healing advisor, what would you like me to do? And he said, study my life, which was, that was um, odd. I, I woke up, I came out of the trance. It's all on video. I had this silly grin on my face because it felt so real. <laughs> and I explained what had happened. And I began studying the life of this ancient Roman statesman, philosopher, playwright. And I realized after studying two things. First of all, he was one of the most interesting people I'd ever encountered in history. He literally ran the Roman Empire for five years. He was the tutor to Nero when Nero was still a youngster. And as Nero's tutor, tutor to the emperor, he ran the empire, and it was known as the Silver Age of Rome, one of, one of the best periods in Roman history. But he also wrote plays, and he wrote a great deal of philosophy. He was one of the leading Stoic philosophers. And at the end of his life, he got implicated as being part of a conspiracy to murder Nero. Now, he wasn't really part of the conspiracy, but apparently the conspirators wanted to install him as the emperor once they did away with Nero because he had such a reputation. And Nero learned about all of this, quashed the conspiracy, and sent a centurion to order Seneca to take his life. Seneca is at a dinner party at the time, and the centurion comes in with orders from the emperor, you, you have to take your life. And Seneca looks at him, he says, well, can I at least make out my last will and testament? The centurion says, no, no time for that. You have to take your own life and do it now. So Seneca turned to his guests at the dinner party and he said, I bequeath to you my life study my life. Those were his last words. And, and I had such a shock of realization when it occurred to me that his very last words were the ones that I heard him speak in this hypnotic experience. So he, he became a very important influence in my life. Well, years later, Brendan Angan, who I didn't know, the co who became the co-author with me of this paper, said he had had a psychic reading from a channeler named Kevin Ryerson. Uh, Kevin happened to have been my friend and knew all about the Seneca story. And he said, Kevin told him that I had been Seneca in a past lifetime and that he, he had been uh, Seneca's a uh, writing partner, I think, uh, named Lucretius. Seneca wrote many letters to Lucretius that were letters of advice and have been published and uh, so on. And he, he said to me, well, maybe we knew each other in a past life. And I wrote back and said, no, I don't think so. I don't believe I was Seneca. Uh, Seneca is a hero to me. Uh, but I did think that uh, it could be an example of synchronicity, that there's some synchronistic connection. And the reason I say that in particular is because the day I got the email from Brendan Engen, I was traveling. I was actually going to Spain at the time uh, to visit the, uh, Cordova in Spain, which is the city where Seneca was born where there's a big statue of Seneca. And I thought that's synchronistic that he'd approach me at, at, at the very moment I'm traveling to the birthplace of, of Seneca. So we interacted for quite a while and it turned out many different synchronicities began happening between myself and Brendan. 
that seem to support this idea of somehow a, a synchronistic connection with a historical person. It didn't mean that we were those people in our past lives, but that there was a resonance that expressed itself through synchronicities. Uh, on one occasion, for example, Brendan Engen went to visit a bookstore and a book literally fell off the bookshelf and hit him on the head. And he picked it up and he saw on the, it was a book called The Looking Glass God. Uh, but when he opened the book up, he saw my name in it. It had been my book. I had sold it apparently to this bookstore and it fell on his head. And so he and I, agreed at that point, we would co-author a paper that this was, in effect, a new theory of the paranormal. It was particularly relevant for people who felt they had a past life connection with uh, important historical figures, uh, that it might be another way of looking at at least some cases of reincarnation. And because uh, I still don't think I was Seneca in a past life, although I will say this, because I look to see what what would confirm that would be if I actually had memories of being Seneca. And I've searched my memory for that and tried to see, do I have any memories of having been in ancient Rome like that? And only one brief moment lasted less than one second I felt that I was in Nero's palace with Seneca. So there's, you know, the, that's the most meager possibility of a, a past life, although it felt very real for one second. But the idea of synchronistic resonance is that we we do have connections with other people that express themselves synchronistically. Uh, Jane Houston. When I described what had happened uh, to her, well, to me, with Seneca, she said she had a similar connection with the ancient uh, Greek philosopher Proclus. When she was even a child, she'd hear in her head a little voice that would say, hocus pocus, where is Proclus? And uh, Proclus, uh, who was a great Neoplatonic philosopher, uh, the last of the great Neoplatonic philosophers has become an important psychic influence in her life in, in the same way. And occasionally I run into other people who feel deeply touched by a historical figure where there are many different synchronistic events that seem to reinforce the connection. So uh, that's what we call archetypal synchronistic resonance. Could you delve into your personal encounters with psychic phenomenon and what convinced you about the possibility of reincarnation? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, I did an interview. Back in the days I was doing radio interviews for Wisdom Radio, I was approached by a medical doctor in San Francisco named Walter Semkew, and he had just published a book about astrology, a very clever book. And I'd interviewed him about astrology. And uh, he noticed when he was visiting me that I happened to, and I still own the URL very early in the days of the internet, I claimed the URL for williamjames.com. William James being the founder of American psychology, a great pioneer in the field of parapsychology, or as it was known in his day, psychical research. And William James was a hero of mine. I, I really uh, respected him, which is why I acquired that website. And Walter Semke, when he learned of it, said, well, maybe you were William James in a past lifetime. And I thought about it and I said, I don't think so. Once again, like Seneca, he's my hero. Not, I wouldn't have been him. I wish I could have been, but uh, I would, if I had been William James in a past lifetime, I imagined I'd be much more accomplished in this lifetime. And he said to me, well, here's what he had, was learning. He, he hadn't yet published his book, Return of the Revolutionaries, 
which was research he was engaged in at the time. He felt he could identify the past lives of different people. And in his book, Return of the Revolutionaries, he felt he could identify people alive today who had been in a past lifetime, some of the founding fathers of the American uh, nation. And so he believed uh, I might have been William James. And he said the way you could determine that, in his opinion, was to look at the people who are the close people today in your life, uh, uh, the closest ones, and see if they match up with people uh, who were known to be close to the past life person, to William James. He said, if you've got a number of people who are close to you, who are similar in personality traits and in physical features to people who were known to be close to William James, that would be a way of identifying it because in his view, people reincarnate in cohorts. That if you're part of a, a, a group of people who were very important and influential, that that cohort would reincarnate together lifetime after lifetime. That's what he was observing, he thought, it, with the founders of the American Republic. And I did that. I picked a list of about 10 people I knew very well. And I did feel that you could kind of match them up with, the, you know, this is very imprecise. This is not scientific. It's it's more artistic and intuitive. But I, I came up with 10 people uh, who seemed to match up, people who were my mentors and my family members and good friends who seem to be that you could equate each one of them with somebody who was known to have been close to William James. So I, I wouldn't regard that as conclusive by any means, but it was I found it to be interesting. I, I, I'm not accepted that I was William James in a past lifetime, once again, because I don't have any of those memories. And I did submit to past life regression. Uh, one of the people I had interviewed, uh, Charles Tremont, a medical doctor, was doing hypnotic past life regressions. And he tried to take me back over and over to a past life as William James. And a few little bits of potentially interesting information that I've never been able to verify came out, such as the idea that uh, he was called Billiam. Uh, as a child, uh, I, instead of William, William, and uh, but the interesting thing I suppose was on every session, at some point I would have to come out of hypnosis because I was getting a stomach ache, of all things. I'm not prone to that, but William James was. And of course, I knew that about William James. I'd read his history. So uh, in spite of all of these clues, I never accepted, and I still don't accept, that I was William James in a past life. But I did I'll give Walter permission in his book, Return of the Revolutionaries, to write up his hypothesis that I was, as long as he pointed out that I personally don't accept it, which, which he did. And he added that, of course, William James wouldn't have accepted it either. So <laughs> he took my non-acceptance as, as further evidence that I was with William James in a past lifetime. And uh, all I can say is I think it's another example of uh, some kind of synchronistic resonance that uh, in, in some ways I, I do feel like I'm following in the footsteps. Of, of William James, but it's, it's very important to distinguish between hardcore scientific evidence and things that you arrive at intuitively that are, are maybe important, very meaningful to you, but are not established as facts. And, and one way to look at it uh, scientifically would be, let's take the case of Madame Curie and her husband, Pierre and Marie Curie. They were great scientists, Nobel laureates, who discovered radium 
and, and really initiated a whole line of research into radioactivity, which is you know crucial to our modern uh, understanding of science. And at the same time, both of the Curies were engaged in psychical research. They attended seances. They were involved in uh, mediumship. Uh, they studied the uh, great medium of the early 20th century, Eusapia Palladino. And Pierre Curie, for his part, was convinced. He said, I saw the table levitate and slowly float around the room during one of these seances. That was very meaningful to him. But Marie Curie put it this way. She said, until we can reproduce it in the laboratory, it is not science. So it, as interesting as it was, even though you, you had a very crucial observation, uh, we can't yet call it science. So a lot of my work is in this gray area. It's not yet science, but uh, it is very interesting and very meaningful. In your series, In Presence, which I'll link in the description, you mentioned fragmented reincarnation. So what is that? Please expand. Oh, okay, yes. So let's ask ourselves the question, what happens when we die? Uh, the Egyptian view is very interesting. For thousands of years, the Egyptian culture was very stable. And the central focus of that culture was the afterlife. One of the great documents that has come out of that culture is the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which goes into very great lengths to describe the journey of the soul after death. Uh, and of course, the enormous uh, economic activity in ancient Egypt had to do with embalming and building pyramids and, and, and so on. The Greeks thought the Egyptians were far too focused on the afterlife and, and death. Um, but one of their ideas of the Egyptians is that the soul is not a single entity. The Egyptians had 10 different words for different aspects of the soul. And the idea is that they might have different destinies. It's possible, at least, to consider that when you die, some part of you might be reincarnated uh, as one person and another part of you might break away and be reincarnated uh, as part of a different person. Uh, you can look at biological organisms in, in which this sort of thing happens. Colonies of cells, for example, that divide up. A cell can divide up into many other cells. And reincarnation might work that way. I, I can't say it's conclusive, but it's certainly worth speculating on. We have very good scientific evidence at this point. I regard it as scientific, even though you can't yet reproduce it in the laboratory, but clear empirical observations. Let me put it that way. We're not at the point of reproducing reincarnation in the laboratory, but we have many good qualified observations that uh, young children, for example, report memories of past lives. So it's good reason to think that some people at least reincarnate. And the uh, University of Virginia uh, Department of Perceptual Studies, they have a database of some 2,700 individuals uh, who were young children, and almost as soon as they can begin to talk, they describe their past lives. So we might say we've got evidence that uh, of, of the 27, I think it's 1,700 were what are regarded as solved cases, uh, which means that the information provided by these young children was sufficient for researchers or family members to actually locate and identify the person who the child is talking about that they say they were in a past lifetime. So you might say we, we got empirical evidence that 1,700 individuals have reincarnated. It doesn't mean everybody will reincarnate or that, here's the thing, part of you might reincarnate and another part 
with you might move to a higher plane in, in the afterlife, which uh, according to uh, the accounts of uh, we get through mediumship and other channeling and other resources, people who have been dead sometimes for decades come back and start describing what it's like, the different stages they go through. So to my way of thinking, it's entirely possible that uh, an individual, a great soul like a William James, might be divided up and might express itself in multiple people. And, and in fact, there are accounts after William James died, there are numerous accounts coming from mediums and channelers of people who feel they're in touch with William James. So uh, if you take them all seriously, and I'm not sure that we should, because I haven't studied them in detail to get a sense of their authenticity, uh, I think it's a possibility that uh, that it works that way. Other people would disagree with me. They would say that the idea of the self, a unitary self that goes from past life to past life, that's the way it works. And all I can say is at this point, we don't have enough data to, to know what, what it's like. I expect when I look at the uh, many, many different accounts of the afterlife, I I expect that there are more possibilities than we can even imagine. From your cases, have you identified any uniform processes that occur after death? Yeah, there, there are many uh, patterns that can be observed from uh, the accounts that we have. I mean, 1,700 solved cases is actually a fairly large number. I can tell you, for example, that uh, most of those cases uh, involve males. And most of those cases involve uh, a violent death of the previous person, which I think is, is more likely to occur if you were a male in a previous life. You're more likely to have had a, a violent death than if you were a female. And uh, also, it does seem as if the sex is the same in 90% of the past lives, and about 10% people uh, apparently change sex, which has led some researchers, researchers to speculate that cases of uh, homosexuality, cases of uh, uh, trans, like what we call today trans people who feel that they they are born in in the in a body which doesn't represent how they feel uh, in terms of their gender, uh, that those cases may be people who recently transitioned from one gender to another. Uh, so there's some interesting uh, theorizing along those lines. Uh, those are some of the, the main things we know, but we can also say uh, that the personalities do seem to be similar from lifetime to lifetime. Uh, the traditional religious idea of karma, that if you're a bad person in one lifetime, you're going to be punished for it in the next lifetime, uh, that doesn't seem to be um, supported by the empirical evidence that we have right now. But it does seem to be the case that the tendencies that you had in a previous lifetime, both uh, your desires, your interests, your personality, your occupational tendencies, those seem to carry forth. It's, it's what the Hindus would call samskaras, the tendencies that you bring with you uh, the tendencies that you have when you die are carried forward. So uh, there, there is a sense that you are largely the same person from lifetime to lifetime, based on, you know, the limited database that we have. Can you please elaborate on the differences in reincarnation studies between Eastern and Western cultures? I remember a discussion about those in Southeast Asia, where the belief in reincarnation is widespread. That is, they tend to come back quicker. Is that correct? Uh, it is correct that uh, the 
cases of uh, reincarnation that come from Asia, and the bulk of cases do come from Asia, uh, in countries where reincarnation is accepted, the interim period between lives is shorter on average. It could be, I think, on average, maybe just a matter of months between uh, the death of uh, one individual and the uh, birth of, of the next life. Uh, and in the Occident and in the Western cultures, um, it could be years. Uh, so, so there is a real difference, but there's a limited number of cases. And one of the most famous cases in the Western literature is the James Leininger case, where uh, he remembered, had a vivid memory of having died in World War II and then was uh, reborn decades later. So, you know, because there's a small number of cases and one or two cases like that with the uh, decades in, in between, it really um, makes the average of the Western cases much longer. Uh, I don't know that we have enough data yet to draw a firm conclusion about it, but from the data we do have, it, it certainly appears as if there's a distinction between the uh, Oriental and the Occidental cases. How does your belief about what may happen after death relate to what actually happens? I know you surmise that we can affect what occurs after death via our beliefs. How do we know if any of this is true? Yes, uh, Professor Jeffrey Kripal, a wonderful uh, philosopher and uh, chair of the Religious Studies Department at Rice University, has made this point exactly, that the afterlife is dependent upon how we think about it and how our cultures seem to think about it. Uh, the way I view it is that there's a very thin boundary between our physical existence and the afterlife. You might say uh, the way um, I did some very interesting interviews with Stephanie Stevens, a Jungian psychologist who explained from the Jungian point of view, the afterlife is part of the collective unconscious that we experience, that uh, we, we're so close to it. For example, my dream of Uncle Harry, uh, many, many people report visitations from uh, deceased friends and relatives in their dreams. The boundary is that thin. And, and she notes Jung himself, when he describes a dream, he'll often say, this deceased person visited me in a dream, very specifically, rather than saying, I had a dream about such and such a person. It, it wasn't just a dream image. Jung seemed to be very clear that he could distinguish between visitations from the deceased versus a dream of the deceased. So there, that seems to be the boundary between uh, everyday consciousness and the afterlife. It's a very, very thin boundary. And Carl Jung, in particular, developed the technique of active imagination as a way to explore the boundary at some point as you're imagining what it might be like. You move from the realm of imagination into what the philosopher Henri Corbin called the realm of the imaginal. The imaginal realm is very subtle. It's not physical, but it is very real. It would be like when Seneca appeared to me in my hypnotic experience and said, study my life. Uh, there was, I only learned from studying his life that there was something very real. Those were his last words. So uh, Henri Corbin, for example, uh, became a Sufi. Uh, part of Islamic mysticism. And he was very interested in studying the Sufi philosophy of illumination as developed by the 12th century mystic Suravardi. And he felt that he had entered into an imaginal world in which Suravardi came to him, taught him directly uh, the, the teachings of uh, illumination. So that would be an example where um, imagination 
leads to something that is more real than uh, mere fantasy. Have you formed an idea of what you call a universal cosmological structure? What might that look like? You know, it's very subtle. It's shifting. It, it doesn't stay the same from moment to moment. But I think it's fair to say if I were to try and map it out schematically, we have the physical world. We know or, or we believe, actually, that the physical world is real. I think most people would uh, uh, agree to that, that what we experience through our senses is real, at least most of the time. It's physical. It, like You can knock on wood and and have a sense of its hardness and physicality. Uh, and then we have this realm of pure imagination, you know, Walt Disney and uh, uh, pirates and fairies and cartoons and, and this fantasy. Uh, the, there's no doubt whatsoever that human beings can have a very active fantasy life. And what I'm suggesting is that there's a third realm. It's somewhere in between fantasy and physicality. It's as real, ontologically speaking, ontologically means the philosophy of what is real. Ontologically real, but it's not physical. Uh, of course, there are many things like that uh, that are ontologically real and not physical. Uh, Plato Describe that as the the realm of forms, for example, the perfect circle. It will never be physical, but uh, it's a real mathematical construct. Mathematicians, by and large, are Platonists in, in this sense. So, But you can build on that. You can say, in addition to physical forms in the Platonic realm, there are archetypes. Uh, there are entities. There may be ancestors, there, there may be uh, spirits that are also very real, autonomous, non-physical entities that uh, exist. This is what basically the religion of spiritualism is based on, the, the idea that the spirits of the dead or maybe even archetypal entities or deities are very real. They are not just products of our imagination. And of course, this will always be very controversial because as Marie Curie said, until you can reproduce it in the laboratory, it's not scientific. But from a philosophical point of view, I think it has a lot of merit. Have you ever met Robert Monroe and recognized, by the way, for his infamous out-of-body experiences? Uh, I did have the opportunity to interview Robert Monroe back in my days at KPFA Radio. He's one of the first people, as a matter of fact, who uh, came across and, and visited me in the studio there. And uh, you got to say he, his work and out-of-body experiences uh, has, to some extent, been replicated in the laboratory. Bob Monroe worked with Charlie Tart. Uh, who was one of my dissertation advisors at Berkeley. And uh, they set up experiments in which uh, Monroe would be asked to leave his body and in a room where there was a shelf near the ceiling that had been placed. So uh, an object that was on the shelf couldn't be viewed from where Monroe was lying down on a bed. Uh, but if he could leave his body, float up to the ceiling, and look above the shelf, he could see what was on the shelf, and he was asked to report on it. And uh, he was able to successfully report on it. Other more sophisticated studies on out-of-body experiences were conducted by uh, Carlos Osis at the American Society for Psychical Research back in the 19. 70s, he worked with a, uh, an out-of-body experiencer named Alex Tanis, and they developed a, a device which was very interesting. It, it projected images optically, but in order to know what those images were, you had to be positioned uh, in a certain location near the device, otherwise you couldn't see it. And once again, Alex Tanis 
was able to describe the target. Now, does that mean they actually left their body, that they traveled in what esoteric people would call the astral body or the etheric body to a location in, (coughs) excuse me, to a location in physical space? Or were they simply using remote viewing or clairvoyance? That's kind of the conundrum. Because we have very good laboratory evidence that clairvoyance exists, remote viewing exists. A person sitting calmly in a chair can access information anywhere in time and space, and they don't need to leave their body to do it. So that that creates a big complication, not only for out-of-body research, but for all the research involving the afterlife and survival after death, that could it be the case that people reporting contact with spirits and information, like a spirit comes through a medium and they describe all kinds of details about their life when they were alive that were unknown to anybody in the room at the time and only through extensive research could be validated. There are a lot of examples of this, but does that mean that it was really that person, uh, their spirit coming through the afterlife, or was it simply a case of the medium using their clairvoyance to access what you could call the Akashic records or what William James called the cosmic reservoir of all knowledge and come up with that information? Many people in parapsychology today argue that that's the way it works, that we know living people have psychic abilities. And because of that, it's very hard to prove scientifically that such a thing as uh, post-mortem consciousness is real. Now, in my case, I don't have any question about it. And the reason is because my experience, my dream visitation with my Uncle Harry was so powerful, so profound, so far removed from normal consciousness that I was just crying tears of joy that uh, for me, there's no doubt. But if you haven't had such an experience, uh, it would be very natural to doubt. Do Eastern traditions or religions offer something different about understanding post-death? One of the reasons that I produce so many videos on the New Thinking Aloud channel, almost a new video every day, is that I feel we are the inheritors of the esoteric cultures uh, that were developed all over the world. It's no longer the case that just because, for example, I was born into a Jewish family that I would only be pursuing uh, the Jewish traditions of mysticism and the afterlife and so on. We are the inheritors of all traditions, whether it's Zoroastrian or Hindu or shamanic or Christian or Jewish or Islamic. I believe that uh, we are all global citizens, and my goal is to share with the audience that I have on on the New Thinking Aloud channel uh, all of these cultures, because I I feel that that if you want to have a complete vocabulary of the various nuances and windows into this extraordinarily vast world of the human psyche, you you need to understand them all. And and of course, that's a never-ending process. But uh, I've gained enormously from practicing yoga, from studying meditation, from being aware of the teachings of Zoroaster, or understanding the like use plant medicines, uh, understanding, of course, many different modern scientific approaches, biofeedback, uh, or uh, as Robert Monroe developed, the, the hemisync uh, notion of the binaural beat effect and how that affects consciousness. Uh, it's incumbent upon anyone who is a serious, I would call them psychonaut, 
an explorer of the inner depths, to have a, a certain level of familiarity with uh, the great world traditions involving consciousness. Are the implications of parapsychological tests like the afterlife or higher conscious abilities irreconcilable with the scientific worldview? And if not, can you even claim to scientifically study them then? How do you bridge these? Well, imagine you're going to uh, see a movie. When you, when you enter into the theater, you buy your ticket and you walk into the theater, you sit down, you know that you're about to watch a work of fiction. But what you do at that point is uh, what scholars call a willing suspension of disbelief. While you're in the movie, you let go of that awareness that this is a work of fiction. You accept it as real. You enter into the story. And uh, people, well, when I was a student of criminology, which is a branch of sociology, uh, there is a a form of research. They're called participant observer research. If you want to understand, you know, what it's like to be a a criminal, you can uh, hang out with criminals and uh, you can you can become part of their culture. And so you will willingly suspend your disbelief in that lifestyle. You will willingly suspend, uh, you know, the idea that you're actually a criminology graduate student so that you can enter into their world. But then later on, you can step back and examine it from uh, what might be thought of as a more objective way. It's, you can, in other words, you can have both. You can have scientific objectivity, and you can also maintain the the openness to enter in fully to the uh, subject that you're studying. Uh, it's hard to do both of those at the same time. I don't advise doing them at the same time, but you can in the course of your investigation, you will have moments when you step back and moments when you really enter into that worldview. I did a lengthy study, a 10-year uh, field study with a man called Ted Owens. I've written a book about him called The PK Man. And when I'm working with him, naturally, you, you want to enter into his world. You You don't want to be constantly saying, no, this can't be, and that can't be, and what about this, and what about that? The goal is to understand him as fully as possible, and then later on, to step back and try to be more objective about it. Could you explain what macro psychokinesis is, and if there's any substantive evidence supporting it? Macro psychokinesis is one of the most controversial areas within parapsychology. And even longtime parapsychologists have a very difficult time with it. It seems as if it, it's okay if people can influence the fall of dice, for example, uh, so in a way that's slightly statistically significant, but to uh, for example, when Uri Geller was going around touching spoons or causing them to bend without even touching them at all, um, parapsychologists were horrified. Like, and, and the reason they were horrified is, is because, first of all, if they were to document this, nobody would believe them. They would be regarded as crazy. And second of all, and probably even more important are the ethical implications. If you can bend a spoon, does that mean you can stop somebody's heart? Uh, or as a cartoon I saw once, uh, there are a couple pilots in an airplane, and, and they're saying, I don't know what you spending spoons is, and then you see the airplane kind of bending in half. Uh, the, the ethical implications of extraordinary parapsychological abilities are frightening. And I don't think there's a way to get around that. If somebody uh, has the power of macropsychokinesis, can they hex someone and cause them to die, as is a, a tradition around the world in shamanic cultures and cultures that have a history of sorcery? And uh, there was an anthropologist named Ronald Rose, for example, who. Um, 
wrote a study of uh, a technique known as the pointing of the bones, which was a uh, method used in certain cultures in the Caribbean to hex someone to the point where they die. And at that time, anthropologists had uh, developed a theory that the reason people die after they've been hexed is because, first of all, they know they've been hexed, and that triggers a stress response on their part, and they die from the stress of knowing that they've been hexed. And uh, Ronald Rose accepted that theory. It was standard. It's consistent with materialistic worldview. But then he encountered cases in his own work as an anthropologist in which the people who were being hexed didn't know they were being hexed. In fact, they were in another country, far away uh, from the uh, Caribbean culture uh, where the hexing took place, and yet they died nevertheless. Uh, so one way to think of that is it could be telepathic. There's a theory about healing that is that it's just a telepathic suggestion. I give you the telepathic suggestion that you will be healed, and then you use that to activate your own innate healing abilities. Similarly with hexing, you get a telepathic message that you're being hexed, and that triggers the stress response that causes you to die. Um, so there's a fine line between macro psychokinesis, you could say, and telepathy. It's hard to know where to exactly draw the lines. Now, in the case of Ted Owens, he specialized in uh, large-scale phenomena. He performed many demonstrations during his lifetime of uh, f involving things like heat waves in the middle of winter, cold waves in the middle of summer, moving hurricanes around tornadoes, volcanoes, earthquakes, large-scale power blackouts. Uh, it's very difficult to research these things because they're often described in kind of vague terms. If I say a heat wave in the middle of winter, that could mean many different things. Uh, nevertheless, over and over and over again, I have in my files over, I think, well over 150 examples of such demonstrations. And it seems over and over and over again, roughly two-thirds of the time, depending on how you want to count, because there's a lot of gray areas in there, things seem to work out as he said they would, sometimes very precisely. On one occasion, he called me up on Christmas Eve, 1985. I'll never forget this because he has this big booming voice and he called me on the phone and said, uh, Jeffrey, this is the most important phone call you will ever receive. And he said, it's up to you now. You have to inform the United States government not to launch the next space shuttle, because if they do, my UFOs, he felt that he was in contact with aliens in a UFO. He said, those UFOs are going to knock it right out of the sky. Now, I, of course, had no influence with the U.S. government. I have never had a relationship with the U.S. government other than uh, being designated as a conscientious objector on, on one occasion, and I suppose getting Social Security. But uh, I had no voice there, and I didn't think even if I had a voice, anyone would care what I had to say. So I ignored him. And then when the Challenger space shuttle exploded about a month later, I was shaken to my bones. And the question is, was that an example of macro psychokinesis? I can't say. I mean, he claimed he was in telepathic contact with aliens and they did it. Uh, so maybe it was precognition. And uh, of course, the official reports talk about the operating 
something so on that it could be explained completely by negligence on the part of uh, the NASA authorities who let that space shuttle uh, launch in the first place, we'll never know. Uh, but uh, the reason I bring up this example is because it was very precise. It was, there's no question he was referring to the Challenger. And he was very clear that if that shuttle were launched, it would be knocked out of the sky. Uh, so there's no denying the, the precision of what he said. In, in that instance, whether it was macropsychokinesis or precognition, I can't say. And that's one of the reason that parapsychologists use the word psi, P-S-I, but it refers to the Greek letter psi, uh, as a the nomenclature that refers to all kinds of parapsychological events, whether it's telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, retrocognition, or psychokinesis is because philosophically, they're very hard to distinguish one from the other. And the example of the Challenger space shuttle illustrates that very well. So there are people uh, in parapsychology like uh, Ed May, a very prominent parapsychologist who received government funding for many, many years to explore remote viewing, he maintains that it can all boil down to precognition, that there never has to be an example of psychokinesis. And there are others uh, like S Stephen Browdy, the former editor of the Journal of Scientific Exploration, who are more inclined to think that psychokinesis and macro psychokinesis is very real. In his instance, as a young man, he witnessed table levitations, tables in his presence rising up. He couldn't even pull them down. They seemed to be rising up of their own accord. And he could think of how do you explain that in terms of precognition? That has got to be macro psychokinesis. And it's been going on for centuries. There are uh, documented cases like that uh, going back to at least the 1800s, I think much earlier, in, in fact. But because they're relatively rare and so unusual, uh, most people are afraid to report it. They say, if I tell people that I witness this table levitating by itself, they'll think I'm crazy. Uh, so one of the major reasons that people are afraid of even talking about their psychic experiences is exactly that, that people will think I'm crazy. And macro psychokinesis is right at the top of the list of th taboo topics for that reason. Did Ted Owens give you any indication as to when at least he claimed his ability started? Ted Owens came from a family in, in which psychic functioning was taken for granted. His grandmother was, uh, and his grandfather was a dowser. The grandmother was something of a medium. It often is the case that this sort of thing runs in families. So he had native talent. I don't think there's any question of that. But at the same time, he felt that he had been visited by aliens. He felt that they had actually encountered him uh, on, on a strange occasion when he was driving in the middle of the desert, as I recall, in Texas, and uh, found himself uh, surrounded by tarantula spiders, and then there was missing time, and he, he felt that they'd actually operated on his brain in, in a way to enhance his psychic abilities. He also felt that they had been working with him since childhood so that he had in his early life many different occupations very strange things. He was a bullwhip artist in a circus sideshow. He had a knife throwing act. He was a high speed typist. He worked as a, an idea man for a railroad. Uh, he was a jazz drummer at, at one time, and he felt that they guided him into all, all of these professions so that his mind was sufficiently flexible that he could work with their system of telepathic communication, which was involved symbols, and he could send symbols and receive symbols 
from them and he would understand what they meant and he knew how to craft symbols to send to them so that they would do things that he asked them to do. That's the way he viewed it. Uh, it's very interesting because uh, on the occasion that I first met Ted Owens, which was a conference in London sponsored by the Parascience Foundation at the University of London in 1976, there was another speaker at the conference, another person who was known for macropsychokinesis. Her name was Suzanne Padfield. She was the wife of a well-known physicist named Ted Baston, and she had worked for over a decade in a what was known at the time as the li laboratory of paraphysics. They had set up experiments with uh, light beams to see if she could bend a beam of light with her mind. Now, that would be another example of macro psychokinesis at a subtle level. And they claimed that they had many examples of her bending a beam of light. And at the same meeting where Ted Owens introduced himself to me, she stood up and she said, You know, I used to think that it was spirits I was working with who performed these activities like poltergeists. But gradually I came to realize that I was using the idea of spirits as psychic support figures because if they were doing it, then I didn't have to take any responsibility. So that freed me up from feeling um, guilty or feeling self-important or uh, anything. I could simply say, well, they did it. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, she said, but I realized over time that actually it was my kinesis and I could do it. I didn't need to credit invisible spirits. I could take responsibility for it myself. And she felt this was the case with other psychics as, as well, who would like Ted Owens, who credited it's all the space intelligence. Although the way he put it was that I have some ability, but they do the big, the heavy lifting it comes from them. Uh, it changed over time. I was never sure when I worked with him uh, what to make of it, except for the fact that he claimed he could produce UFO sightings and did so on many occasions. So including uh, one instance in which, again, this could be precognition, he called me up one day, we were doing a project to see if he could produce UFOs. And he said, there's one coming. He said, I can feel it. He says, this is going to be one of the biggest UFO sightings ever. It will be seen by hundreds of people. It will be photographed. And he said, the photograph is going to be published on the front page of one of your local papers in the San Francisco Bay Area. Well, five days later, that's exactly what happened. The uh, sighting took place on a college campus. It was being, uh, there was an event being sponsored by the art department of Sonoma State College, uh, as it was called at that time. It's now Sonoma State University. And the art department had an artist who uh, named Stephen Paleski, who flew an airplane a little airplane with smoke trailing out the back and he made designs in the sky and that was his art form. And so the art department is out there, hundreds of students with their cameras. Stephen Paleski is in the air making designs when right in his airspace, a UFO appears and he sees it and reports on it and people on the ground see it and photograph it and what do you know? The photograph was published on the front page of the Berkeley Gazette. So, and not only that, it was videotaped, and the videotape was broadcast on the Channel 9 AQED evening news, of all things. So, I'd have to say that's very unusual that uh, something like that would happen. It, I don't know of any other instance offhand in which a major city newspaper published a UFO picture on the front page, but it happened five days after Ted Owens told me it's about to happen. Am I accurate in inferring that you recently undertook a test to assess 
if you're still receiving post-death communications from Ted? Yes. In, on December 12th, to be precise, last year, 2022, I got a message from one of the viewers of the New Thinking Aloud channel in Germany. And he told me while he was meditating, a figure appeared. He's a deep meditator. He's already half hour into his meditation and he sees this figure and doesn't know what to make of it. And gradually he could see it's a human being. And because he was familiar with my video channel, he recognized the figure is Ted Owens. And Ted Owens told him, I have a message I want you to give to Jeffrey. And he said he sat and he meditated on that for months because he was afraid because it, he thought it could be a fantasy. But he, after several months of examining himself, he determined for himself it was no fantasy. It was real. And he reached out to me and passed on the message. And so he's, the message is, Jeffrey, uh, Ted Owens knows that you might want to reach out to him. I didn't have any thoughts of that until I got the message. Uh, but you can do so in meditation. And I thought, well, all right, I'll see if I can in meditation contact Ted Owens. He had been dead 35 years by that time. He died in 1987. And one day, on, in fact, to be precise, on December 28th, 2022, I felt that I had contacted Ted Owens in meditation. I felt that we had had a conversation. I felt that he had agreed to perform a demonstration or to ask the space intelligences to perform a demonstration. And at the time, I was very concerned for the people of Ukraine. I was aware of the fact that news reports said that the invading Russians were now destroying the Ukrainian infrastructure, their power system, so they wouldn't have heat in the winter that was coming. And I asked Ted Owens to use his abilities, which I knew he had a history of creating hot spells in the middle of winter to create a hot spell so that the Ukrainian people wouldn't suffer and that we would run a test for 90 days from December 28th up until about the 28th of March, which is roughly a month ago. And uh, I am now analyzing the data to see whether there was a, a statistically significant uh, heat spell in, in Ukraine. Uh, <clears throat> I can say this for what it's worth, that only a few days after I announced which I did on the New Thinking Aloud channel that very day. I announced it on December 28th that we're going to run this trial. By January 1st, there was an unbelievable heat spell all over Europe. Thousands of temperature records were broken in one day. The problem is, in my recollection of the conversation with Ted Owens, I didn't say all over Europe. I said Ukraine. And uh, so it's, I can't say even if, you know, that heat spell did occur, uh, whether it's really related to the conversation I believe I had with Ted Owens. Um, so probably in another several weeks, we'll have analyzed the data and I'll be able to say for sure whether or not the weather in Ukraine was statistically warmer uh, over the winter. Uh, right now, I just don't know. I'm inclined to think probably it was warmer, but not necessarily statistically significant. So, But until we've completed running all the numbers, I don't know for sure. Given that Ted's predictions weren't consistent, what does that say to you? What, what you're looking at is the question of imprecision. And yes, in, in real life, when you're doing case study research of the paranormal, there very often is imprecision. If, For example, if you're 
doing an astrology reading or an I Ching reading, trying to determine, is this reading accurate for me? Well, the readings are usually very, very general, and it's very, very hard to determine in, with any kind of scientific precision whether or not they're accurate. So it, it gives a lot of room for the true believers to uh, say, you know, it's a perfect description of me because they don't have to uh, specify. He said this date and this time and exactly this event and the temperature change will be such and such. So in in real life, we often assume that uh, an imprecise event means a certain thing for us. Whereas in in the scientific laboratory, you can't operate that way. You have to be very, very precise. If you're doing a, a, a psychokinesis experiment, you've got everything specified in advance, what the targets are, what statistical tests you're going to use, what outcome will satisfy your experiment, and what outcome would be a disconfirmation of your hypothesis. In real life, uh, field studies, it doesn't work that way at all. So an interesting question to ask yourself is, do we really learn more from experiments than we do from field studies? And that I'm not sure. The reason I say that is because the early work in what was called psychical research in the 19th century was largely field study research. And they approached it with the discipline that a, a police detective would have in doing police work. You try to get corroboration testimony from other witnesses. You try to see if there are any documents that will support the uh, hypothesis. You, you look for confirmations where you can find them. And you draw conclusions based on your analysis of the data, not so different than the way a literary critic might analyze a novel and say, what is, what is the meaning to be found in this novel? And uh, we have great works that were published in, in that era. For example, F.W.H. Myers in 1903 uh, posthumously published his great book, Human Personality and its Survival of Bodily Death. Uh, and it, it runs for hundreds of pages in two volumes and is a masterful analysis of, of the human psyche and how there are there's a spectrum of, of events from uh, normal human consciousness to the most extreme forms of uh, psychokinesis and precognition uh, that point towards the survival of human consciousness. It seems to be a continuum. Of evidence, so the the experimental work in parapsychology largely began in the 1930s with J. B. Ryan at Duke University doing card guessing experiments. Uh, they were very precise, capable of statistical analysis. Conditions are well controlled at this point. Over a thousand of these experiments have been published. The results are very clear statistically that there's a weak effect that is consistent, but it doesn't occur 100% of the time. And uh, now, have we learned any more from the experiments than we already knew from the field studies? I'm inclined to think no. I'm inclined to think that the basic facts were well understood, the way the phenomena function could be well understood through field studies. But what the experiments gave us was not a better understanding, but really a confirmation of what we already knew to be the case from the field studies. We could now say they've been verified through experiments. In light of the aerial school incident in Zimbabwe, where school children reported a UFO landing and warning about humanity's destructive technology, What's your perspective on this cautionary message? The warnings concerning technology and concerning pollution of the planet are, are very real, and you find them across many cultures. I've done a series of now 40 interviews with James Tunney, 
He is the author of uh, such books as Tech Bondage, Slavery of the Human Spirit. Uh, the idea of science is turning people into robots, so to speak, that uh, we are losing touch with our innate capacities. I described earlier with Eugene Houston's metaphor of the human organism as being like a Stradivarius violin, and we only learn to play it like a plastic fiddle. And I'm afraid to say that cell phones and television and uh, electronic technology, the world in which we're embedded, and I feel very much a part of that world, it's given us a great deal, but it also takes something away from people. It takes away a sense of soulfulness, a sense of uh, there's something larger to us than simply being, a, you know, a successful entrepreneur or, uh, you know, many people who, who are engaged in the world of science and technology have the attitude that he who dies with the most toys wins, that it's all about uh, material possessions and material acquisition, uh, that we lose something of ourselves. And the modern world as a whole has, has been defined this way over and over again by different people. Carl Jung, the great Swiss psychiatrist, wrote the, the book, uh, Modern Man in Search of a Soul. Uh, people credit Nietzsche with saying that God is dead. But what I think he really meant is everybody thinks God is dead. God is no longer a living presence in the life of people, even religious people, so-called religious people, seem to be more concerned with uh, suppressing uh, trans children than in, for example, cultivating their own spirit. Uh, it's a very serious problem in our culture. Imagine, uh, for example, means to me having earned a doctoral diploma in parapsychology over 40 years ago and uh, being really aware of the very extensive history, thousands of experiments and field studies going back well over 150 years, and all of this information is pushed to the fringes and almost never talked about inside of our educational institutions, even inside of our churches, or inside of our scientific establishments. This knowledge is considered taboo. And at the same time, an understanding of who we are as individuals is being lost. Knowledge of the afterlife, for example, is knowledge of who we are. It's knowledge of our own psyche. And uh, people instead begin to think of themselves as cogs in a great machine. You, you know, let's keep the economy going. Let's uh, get a successful job. Uh, and I know people are disenchanted. I hear young people saying, why should I spend four years getting a college degree only to uh, be able to work in a job that I'm going to hate for the rest of my life? That it makes people feel like their own dignity is, is has to be sacrificed in order to earn a living. That, that's what our culture is like right now. And so the fact that you hear over and over and over again from different sources, even now coming from extraterrestrials supposedly landing in flying saucers, that we're not paying enough attention to our own inner nature, is not surprising. What are some of the difficulties that parapsychology, and perhaps even the scientific method, has to overcome? There, you know, we could talk a long time about this subject. My mentor, Arthur, whom we've spoken earlier, uh, felt that we have to go beyond science. Science itself is incapable of addressing first principles, like why was the universe created in the first place, is not a question that science can answer. And in order to begin to get a handle on 
first principles, it sometimes becomes necessary to develop a mindset which uh, is more like the, the way the right brain works. The right brain works in images. It, the right brain is where we get messages in our dreams. And um, the psychiatrist Eric Frohn wrote a book called The Forgotten Language, which is the language of dreams. This would be the a language of the most primitive people because they all had dreams. And in and, and most primitive times, they didn't really make such a clear distinction between waking reality and sleeping reality. The Australian Aborigines would merge from the dream time. That is the original language that people spoke and understood. Uh, and, and it's the language of animistic cultures everywhere Today, it kind of makes no sense whatsoever from a strict scientific perspective. And yet we see that if you follow strict scientific protocols, yeah, there are amazing accomplishments. You can build atomic bombs. At the same time, you can build giant computers. But at the same time, you can build spaceships. But at the same time, you're polluting the planet. And worse than that, we find that Let's take the behavioral sciences. There is a crisis today in behavioral science, and I think many other sciences as well, probably biological sciences. It's a crisis of replicability. Many experiments that were considered models, that were considered paradigms of good experiments and have been followed for years and years in different fields are, are now not being replicated. And so in the field of behavioral sciences, uh, people are wondering what are the limits of the scientific method? Are we running up against an uncertainty principle, uh, which is well known in physics, that uh, there's only so much that science can tell us about subatomic particles. If you want to measure their position, you're not going to be able to measure their momentum. If you try to measure their momentum, you won't be able to measure their position. Uh, are there limits like that to our understanding of, of knowledge itself? And uh, the same question was addressed by Einstein's colleague at the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies in um, Princeton, the great logician, whose name is on the tip of my tongue right now. Um, I'm sorry, it, uh, it's not coming to me, but uh, it, it'll probably, I'll, I'll blurt it out in, in, in a few minutes, or I could look it up. Um, who came up with the, um, a similar principle uh, to the indeterminacy principle in physics. It's the idea that no system of knowledge is ever capable of explaining itself. No system of logic, no system of mathematics can ever explain it, itself. You always have to go to a meta stance, a larger system, in order to explain any system. And what we find I think when, when extraterrestrial communications seem to be pointing towards the absurd, you could say that it, it, they're pointing towards a meta system, a system that is beyond science itself, beyond logic itself. My uh, mentor, Arthur Young, used to call it dirty thinking, actually. And, and it's where sometimes it takes a paradox, it takes a joke, it, it requires humor or poetry or something just to get you out of the box that you're imprisoned, the, the logical box that in, imprisons us, that uh, we all seem to walk around in a prison of our own thoughts. Typically, they're telling us what is possible and what is impossible. And uh, there are many people today uh, who have recently, in fact, published articles that all the data of parapsychology, the thousands of 
articles and uh, published scientific studies, um, they say we don't have to pay attention to them at all because we know it's impossible and impossible things can't happen. Therefore, why bother to even look at the research? And uh, the the way to get out of that is, is to break free from the logical constraints that, that are holding you down about what is and what is not possible. That certainly is true in, in the realm of uh, the human being. You know, what does it mean to be human? Why are we here at all in the first place? Why is there a universe? You will never answer those questions with, from within a logical scientific framework. The answers come to us from mythology. They come to us from what Arthur Young used to call the realm of mythos. That's why, for example, he was interested in astrology. If you ask yourself the fundamental question of uh, mysticism, mystics say, all is one. We are one with everything. That's, that's the basis of every mystical tradition, ultimately. And yet we find ourselves uh, as individuals, how do I, as a skin encapsulated ego, someone who exists inside this body, how do I relate to the idea that I am also one with the whole universe? Well, that relationship occurs through what Arthur described, he called it the realm of mythos. And that is, uh, you find that in astrology, you find that in every mythological system. Those are the stories that we tell ourselves that connect us to a larger universe. And ultimately, they tend to be stories that are completely irrational from a scientific perspective, which is why, once again, I developed the theory with Brendan Engen of archetypal synchronistic resonance. It's as if the universe does speak to us. The universe is conscious, uh, but it speaks to us in riddles. It speaks to us in synchronicities. And uh, so to have a sensitivity to that is a way of acknowledging your connection to the absolute. How do Christianity, Buddhism, and Vedantic thought relate? Are they in disagreement? Are they in harmony? Uh, we talk about Indra. Uh, is a good example of a god who was very much in the same vein as as the god of Jews and the god of Christians. Yahweh and Indra are similar. They wield thunderbolts. They are the uh, king of all of uh, the heavenly hosts or the other devas or the other gods. Uh, and they are, of course, the, the god of a particular people in the earliest days. And in ancient India, Indra was the, the main god, the god of all gods, the king of the gods. And in the Vedic tradition, which are the earliest scriptures from India, the, this, this Indra is the most frequently mentioned of all the deities. And yet today, if you go to India, you won't find any temples to Indra. Indra has, has become a very diminished figure. And it happened at around the time that the philosophers who developed the Upanishads uh, came, came about, which is, took a, is, is a period that lasted for many centuries, the development of the Upanishads. But what great philosophers of the Indian subcontinent developed was an idea that there are philosophical principles expressed by new deities, by Brahma, for example, who represented the whole universe by Vishnu and by Shiva. These were no longer the uh, gods like Indra. Indra was a god like Zeus or Thor as, as well. Um, and there's a story in the uh, Upanishads and the ancient scriptures in, in which Indra conquers the evil dragon, Vritra. Vritra is, is like a, yeah, a reptilian beast, and he's out to destroy the human race. Uh, and he's very, very powerful. In fact, he swallows Indra, and Indra is only freed because the other devas 
and help him escape from inside the belly of Ritra. And then he uses his thunderbolts and he slays Ritra. And now he's the king of the gods. They all celebrate his victory over this evil demon. And in order to satisfy his need for glory, Indra builds a magnificent palace on top of Mount Meru, the uh, home of the gods. And uh, Vishvakarma is the builder of the palace, and it's completed, and he shows it to Indra, and Indra is walking through this amazing palace, and he says, not enough. He wants more. He, his glory is such he needs bigger palaces and greater palaces, and Vishvakarma has to keep working, making the palace more and more magnificent for him. And, and finally, Vishvakarma is, is worn out from all of this building. It's like Indra will never be satisfied. There will never be a palace great enough for Indra. And so he appeals to Brahma, the universal principle, uh, and it's the principle of Brahman and in, in, in India. In the uh, Upanishads, Brahman is the essence of reality. And it's a great principle. And he appeals to that. And Brahman has to appeal to Vishnu. Vishnu is such a great deity. Vishnu has many different avatars who appear in physical form and represent him. And Vishnu sends one of his avatars in, down to Mount Meru in the form of a beautiful little child. And Indra sees this little child outside of his magnificent palace. And he's so excited. The child is so charming and so beautiful that Indra comes to him and says, let me show around this palace. And the child is being shown around. And Indra is showing, isn't this marvelous? And the child says to him, Oh, this is the most beautiful palace that any Indra has ever built. He says, what? Any Indra? I'm Indra. What do you mean, any Indra? When the little child points towards a column of ants that are marching in through the door of the palace, and he says to Indra, well, you see these ants? He says, every one of them was once an Indra. And that represented a turning point for the uh, theology of ancient India. They moved beyond the, the kind of pantheon of gods. The ancient Vedic pantheon is very similar to the Greek pantheon, to the Norse pantheon. And in, in the early days of the Hebrew religion, uh, Yahweh, the god of the Hebrews, was regarded more as as this our God, our cult God, but he's more powerful than your God. And eventually that emerged to a theology of, oh, there is only one God. That, that happened gradually over time. And so uh, the theological sophistication of different cultures evolved over time. Is, is, is what I'm saying. So that if you study the evolution of these theologies, uh, you begin to see that they do converge, that there is a sense in which uh, the mystical teachings of every culture are pointing to the same reality. Uh, it's known in modern thought as the perennial philosophy, but you don't find it necessarily in the exoteric teachings. If, if you, you know, the teachings that I learned in my early religious training describe a, a different kind of deity than one finds in, in the writings of the great mystics. And in those teachings are kept often hidden from people. For example, in, in the Jewish culture, there is a mystical teaching of Kabbalah, uh, but you're taught, you have to be 40 years old before you're ready to even begin to study it. It's, it's felt like it's, it's dangerous if you get into it at an earlier period. And uh, I think the same is true with the teachings of the great mystics of other cultures. Uh, uh, probably in um, the teachings of Buddha, for example, uh, 
are more direct in that sense. Buddha was a mystic, but even in Buddhism, you start out with the Four Noble Truths, and then later on you learn in Buddhism, well, you can, the Four Noble Truths are not the end-all and be-all. In fact, everything we've taught you up until now isn't really true. The real truth of the Diamond Sutra, for example, can't be expressed in words. It's not a simple teaching. It's a teaching that you only can experience directly in your heart. It can never be transmitted through words or through words alone. There, there are other teachings that go beyond words, that go beyond philosophy. So you have in, in, in Buddhism what's known as the prajna paramita, which means the wisdom of going beyond. It's the same word para, paramita, is the same root word, para, as in parapsychology, which means beyond psychology. There, you need to go further. Do the so-called gods of the occult fit into the perennialist idea? They, they do, but the perennial wisdom is not usually taught at the beginning stages of religion. People, you to to become, and, and I guess the, here's the reason why. As you grow up, young children have, I think, a, a natural sense of mysticism. Uh, they come from, you know, they come from the, the great beyond, and then they're embodied, so, which is why I think some young children talk about their past lives right away. They can remember them. They can remember the state between lives, but, but those are rare and often occasioned by a violent death uh, earlier on. But the goal of a young child is to learn how to function in the physical world, learn how to tie your shoes, learn how to make your bed, learn how to get along with your uh, peers, for example. And that becomes almost of ultimate importance for young people is being recognized and accepted by their friends, learning how to have friends, learning how to accomplish things in the physical world. And in so doing that, they lose touch with the uh, perennial wisdom that was their natural state when they were born. As I mentioned earlier, Freud described that as a state of uh, infantile regression to the womb. It could also be thought of as a state of mystical oneness. But as, as you're growing up in life, you, you want to put that aside. It doesn't help you as a young child learning how to you know, get better in sports and do well in school and have friends to uh, remember that you're one with everything. That gets lost. And then you reach a point, typically, in my case, I think around the age of 21 or so, you become an adult. And at that point, I think if people often, at least many people of my generation, certainly, probably with the help of drugs as, as well, begin to open up to these inner realities and, and begin to develop a uh, a more comprehensive understanding of uh, the perennial philosophy. Uh, it, not that it was ever taught to me. I had to reach out for it and, and find it. Uh, but if you do reach out, as they say, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And uh, so there are many, many ways in which people can uh, become acquainted with this very rich and substantial tradition. And today, there's even a, a branch of psychology called transpersonal psychology that, that deals with it. So it's available in, in that form to some young people. But I should say the American Psychological Association refused to recognize transpersonal psychology as being a legitimate discipline in, in, in and of itself. So like parapsychology, it's all also taboo. So uh, I guess the point I'm, I'm saying is that the uh, it would be wonderful if we had a culture in which the perennial wisdom was available from childhood 
uh, to people. But that's not the culture in which we live right now. That's one of the reasons uh, that people are warning us about the direction our whole culture is moving into. We're becoming more and more like machines and less and less like spiritual beings. Hopefully we can reverse. What do you think of Wolfgang Smith's assertion that these two realms are antithetical? So that is the Christian and Vedantic thought are antipodal. Uh, this idea of uh, sort of sacrificing your ego on the altar of spirituality uh, or, or the idea of uh, let go of all desires. The, the ego is the problem. Uh, was often discussed in the days in which I lived with Arthur Young at the Institute for the Study of Consciousness. And he was uh, opposed to that idea uh, because the way he put it, and now you're talking to a very accomplished human being, a man who felt that he wasn't even worthy of becoming a philosopher until he had already invented the helicopter. He said, it's not a good idea to sacrifice your ego on the altar of spirituality until you have developed an ego worthy of being sacrificed. So he he would say that uh, for young people who, you know, become devotees of a guru and they give up their ego and they are devout followers of whatever path they have chosen, uh, they have become like children in a way, and they have given up their sovereignty. They have turned it over to some spirit master uh, in, in exchange for the hope of uh, achieving enlightenment. And he uh, felt that that was a mistake, that people need to cultivate themselves. And when they're ready, they will... Uh, have opportunities to uh, open up more to the spiritual world, but to do it as a substitute for uh, the cultivation of why we're here on, on this planet, which in his view was to develop mastery over the physical plane, then uh, he, he felt it was a mistake and, and that you don't get enlightened that way. You enter into a state that you might mistake for enlightenment. Arthur Young advocated gaining control over the physical before earning the right to philosophize. Can you elaborate on what led him to this? I'm not sure that I am uh, entirely prepared to defend Arthur Young's uh, position in, in that regard. I find it very inspirational. Uh, at the same time, I think that uh, people, there are, so many distinctions between human beings that I would be very hesitant to try and prescribe uh, a, a pattern that everybody must follow, that everybody should be like Arthur Young and, uh, you know, and come up with a new invention. That's something that he decided for himself. And I can't say that it made him an enlightened person. It made him a, a very valuable mentor. Uh, for me, but as I recall, uh, he, he was a great soul. There's no doubt about it. I remember when Arthur Young died, a double rainbow appeared in the sky, or a double no, a double halo appeared in the sky uh, on the day he died over Berkeley. It was so extraordinary. It was uh, photographed and it appeared in the newspaper. And my friends uh, who are more traditional uh, would say that that was a sign that a great soul had passed. Uh, and I think he was a great soul, but enlightened is, is a very different state and it means different things to different people. In Arthur Young's case, I'm under the impression that he was not uh, indifferent about dying. He didn't want to die as he got older. He was in his 90s uh, when he didn't think he was 90, when he died in 1995. But uh, I always thought he was, maybe he was even a little bit afraid of death. Uh, toward the very end, he was searching desperately for some sort of miracle cure that, that could prolong his life even more. And it seems to me that a good sign of enlightenment would be a willingness to 
face death, or as the Buddha would say, an indifference to whether you're dead or alive. Uh, so there are many degrees and many kinds of, of enlightenment. And I don't want to uh, necessarily judge some person who at a young age, without having uh, accomplished anything of importance in the physical world, like inventing the helicopter, uh, if they choose to follow a, a guru and devote their lives to that guru, uh, it's not up to me to judge that person. But I would say for myself, I find Arthur Young's advice very worthwhile and, and very meaningful. And I don't think it's inconsistent throughout your life to, to want to learn and develop and grow and at the same time, to uh, be aware of the uh, traps of uh, the ego. I'm, I'm certain beyond all doubt that if you want to grow spiritually, you definitely don't want to fall into ego traps. Those are uh, the things that most prevent a person from entering into uh, a state of greater enlightenment uh, but but that can be done you can enhance the ego um, and you can at the same time uh, grow spiritually and the, the, here's how I envision it for myself Here, here's how I tell it to people and, and that is to love yourself unconditionally and by that I mean love your spiritual self your higher self unconditionally. Unconditionally means no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter what you think, no matter what you feel, and no matter what anybody else says, thinks, does, or feels with regard to you. Because you can recognize there's a part of your being at the deepest core that is a, a, a spiritual essence that is infinite, and is that's the part of us that is one with everything. And if we can just recognize that and love ourselves unconditionally because of it, we can continue to move through life, to grow, to learn, to uh, progress, and to cultivate ourselves without getting caught in ego traps, because to the best of my knowledge, ego traps emerge when we don't love ourselves, when we hate ourselves or dislike ourselves at some level, but we don't want to admit it. So therefore, we need to feel important in, in, in some way or other. And it's that need that causes us to separate ourselves from the, the oneness, which is at the very core of our being. Did Arthur achieve his spiritual states through accomplishments as opposed to love or faith? Well, I think for some people it can be accomplishment. I don't think it has to be uh, for everyone. It could be just, you know, being a good son, a good father, a good friend to uh, the people you know. That, that could be enough if you love yourself unconditionally, no matter what, whether or not you accomplish anything, that gives you the opportunity to get in touch with what might be your unique purpose, your unique destiny in life. And uh, being in touch with that is a source of such bliss, such joy, it's hard to express. I, I feel very fortunate that uh, I followed my dreams as a young man and got in touch with my destiny, which was to be a communicator and, and to do it through television and now through the Internet and to, to have conversations like the one I'm having with you right now. That That's the essence of my purpose. So it, it's the most natural thing in the world for me to do. Um, but it's going to be different for every person. We're all put on this planet, I think, uh, for a, a special purpose uh, that we need to discover. Some people say uh, that we make a contract before we're born, that this is what we're going to do, and, and we need to get in touch with what it was we have already agreed to. But however you view it, it's going to be different for each person. 
according to a story in the Talmud, were surrounded by innumerable demons, a fact too frightening for us to accept. What does this say about fear? Well, I can tell you this. I have never read that statement uh, on the air. I'm not even familiar with it. Here's what I'm familiar with when it comes to Talmudic legends. And that is that for each human being, there is an angel. And uh, that angel walks in front of us everywhere we go and says, behold, here comes the image of God. So uh, you can view their way. <laughs> I'm not saying that, that we are free from temptations. We are, I would even go so far as to agree with Rudolf Steiner, the Austrian mystic, who was a big influence in my life, that each and every one of our thoughts is itself a spiritual entity. And that uh, when we have a negative thought, a thought that might say, oh, I'm really stupid or uh, something to that effect, that, that is a demonic entity trying to gain control over us uh, by making us hate ourselves, by making us feel guilty about ourselves. And so my practice is when I have such a thought, I say to myself, cancel that thought. I'm alert. I watch the thoughts that pass through me. And when they happen to be negative thoughts, I make a point of uh, acknowledging that I don't own that thought. That thought is not me. And that means I'm not buying into the negativity that uh, we are surrounded. I'd like to switch gears just a bit. What are some of the common limitations to psi ability? For instance, when I interviewed Thomas Campbell, he said, I can't demonstrate it for you now because who knows, we could be cheating and people wouldn't believe it anyway, which I found to be extremely disappointing. What we're talking about are blocks to psychic functioning. And the most basic finding of parapsychology research is known as the sheep-goat effect. And uh, it's very simple. A sheep are regarded as individuals who believe that they can do it. They're put into an experiment where they're asked to guess uh, what card is going to come up or guess what a target at a remote location is about. People who believe that they can do it do better in those tests. And people who believe that this is something they certainly cannot do tend to do worse. In fact, sometimes they actually score below chance, significantly so. It's what we call psi missing, which suggests that actually the correct information is coming into their subconscious mind, and then they're blocking it so that they get the wrong answer more often than could be expected by chance alone. So, that, that would be one of the first major blocks is what we say to ourselves. If, if you begin to at least acknowledge there's a possibility that you can do this, you're already a step ahead. Uh, the other thing that the research itself suggests, and this is quite consistent with the ancient uh, yoga sutras, is that when you can relax and quiet your mind, you're going to be a better telepathic and clairvoyant receiver of information. Conversely, it also seems to be the case that if you're in a state of extreme emotion, for example, if you're in an emotional crisis, maybe you've had an accident, maybe you're dying, then you tend to be more of a telepathic transmitter. So th that's an interesting observation that's that's been made. Now, there are many other blocks to psychic functioning. Uh, people are afraid of parapsychology, afraid of psi for different reasons. Uh, one big reason is if you've been raised in a fundamentalist religious tradition, you might believe that any kind of psychic functioning is demonic, and you're afraid of it for that reason. You begin to have psychic insights. Typically, uh, parents get afraid when their children show a lot of psychic precociousness. They don't like it, and they tell their children to stop doing it. 
for example. Uh, there are many cases like that. And here's another very unusual finding with regard to people who report lots of spontaneous psychic experiences. A very high percentage of them also report trauma, early child trauma. They come from abusive families, for example. And what seems to be the case in uh, those instances, when you're a young child and you're being traumatized, you retreat from the world. You find safety in an inner world, in a world of your own imagination, for example, with invisible friends, for example, or uh, just retreating into your own shell. Well, when you do that, as I discussed earlier with you, you enter into the realm of the imagination, and the imagination is a doorway into what we call the imaginal, which is a psychic realm. You may find yourself first finding comfort from imaginary friends, and the next thing, it might be an actual spiritual entity, hopefully not a demonic entity. Now, other blocks uh, also are related to uh, things like stress. You know, having high stress levels can sometimes precipitate psychic functioning. At the same time, as I mentioned earlier, they if you're all stressed out, your mind is noisy. It's, it's hard to quiet your mind. And so people who are good meditators people who are good at self-hypnosis, people who understand uh, principles of relaxation, like the Jacobsonian relaxation principles, uh, are all, or basic stress management principles, are all better uh, at psychic functioning. Uh, and another thing the research tells us is that people who are artistically inclined, artists and musicians, people who use the right brain more, I'm saying the right brain, but I'm touching the left side of my head. <laughs> uh, people who, who are activating uh, the right brain seem to be more open to psychic functioning. Well, they perform better in simple experimental laboratory tests. And uh, it's probably because they're more open to uh, the intuitive side of life, to the irrational side of life. People who are uh, very mechanical, very materialistic, engineers, for example. If you were to do a uh, test comparing engineers versus artists and musicians, I would predict that the artists and musicians will do more uh, show more psychic functioning in the laboratory. The engineers are likely to show psi missing. But there's another element to this, and it has to do with self-confidence in general. If you are a highly successful professional, chances are you're going to do well in psychic functioning because you're already using your intuition to be a successful person in life. So uh, a study was done, for example, with business executives. Business executives were divided into two groups, those whose companies were profitable and those whose companies were losing money. And they were given tests, computerized tests of precognition in which the, the computer chose a target and the person was asked to identify the target in advance. The executives from the successful businesses scored positively and the executives whose businesses were losing money showed psi missing in, in that test. So I think to the extent that people learn how naturally to incorporate intuition into their lives, uh, is, is a reflection of how well they will do when, when they're tested in the laboratory. What factors contribute to enhancing psi-ability? Well, there's always stuff that we're going to miss. We haven't talked about diet. There are people who believe that a vegetarian diet, for example, promotes psychic functioning, that if you uh, eat too much meat, 
you get filled with all these animal hormones, particularly the hormones that are in their body uh, as they're being killed, uh, which would be uh, hormones associated with the emotions of fear and aggression, and, and that that interferes with psychic functioning. I don't know if it's true because it hasn't yet really been studied carefully in the laboratory, but there's a lot of folklore to uh, suggest that sort of thing. Um, and on the other hand, just because a person thinks of themselves as highly psychic doesn't mean that they're going to perform well in a laboratory. There are many people who are professional psychics who have a long track record of doing what they do, the way they do it, the, the way they want to do it, uh, if you put such an individual in a laboratory where they're asked to perform a task uh, at the uh, that was designed by the researchers and is not necessarily compatible with the normal way of working, they may not do well at all, which I think occasionally leads researchers to become cynical about people who proclaim to be psychic. And, and of course, I also have to be very clear, there are all kinds of ways in which we can delude ourselves about, are we really psychic or not? Uh, if, for example, if Ted Owens uh, says to me, I'm going to create warmer weather in Ukraine, and then what we discover is, oh, there was warmer weather in Germany, there was warmer weather in France, there was warmer weather in the Netherlands, there was warmer weather in uh, Belarus. Uh, therefore, I it must have done it. It's, it's very easy to fall into those kinds of patterns, just to take a what was basically a miss and call it a near hit and say, yeah, that shows that I'm psychic. You see a lot of that, people who are reaching to find ways to identify themselves as, as psychic. Uh, every researcher in parapsychology has been approached by someone who says, I'm psychic, you got to test me, I'm really great. And it turns out that maybe they've deluded themselves in, in one way or another. So I think the lesson there is that the human potential for greatness is balanced by a, a human potential for folly. Uh, and when you move into this field, you need to be aware of both of those potentials so that you can avoid the folly and follow the path that leads to whatever greatness is for you. It's peculiar and even convenient, some would say, that paranormal phenomenon everywhere evade captures such as on Skinwalker Ranch. So how do you interpret this? Well, I, I will say this, there are occasions such as the Skinwalker experience where there were all kinds of phenomena that somehow occurred and, and made sure that the researchers knew that they occurred and yet avoided capture on camera. But there are many, many other instances in which people do photograph orbs and photograph UFOs and uh, other kinds of uh, paranormal entities. Uh, so it, it's not as if there's a rule that you can never photograph them. It seems as if uh, each of these manifestations has its own unique personality. Since you began your journey, especially with New Thinking Aloud, your YouTube channel, which is linked in the description, what lessons or discussions are there that were difficult for you to accept? I suppose... I never appreciated throughout my life, whenever I chose to follow my own passion, the extent to which uh, there would be people definitely opposed to me going in that direction. And I mean, it began, for example, as an undergraduate, when I decided to join various student protests and discovered that oh, you're about to be punished because you took part in a protest. Uh, and when I went into parapsychology, I imagined why well, everybody should applaud this uh, young person moving into uh, a, an exciting new field and coming up with new discoveries. And, and then I realized, oh, no, there's a significant 
percentage of the population who, who are uh, definitely opposed, who feel that this this has no place in the university, and and, and went to great lengths to try and, and in effect destroy my academic career. And I can tell you that I, I now appreciate that virtually everybody in parapsychology, with maybe one or two exceptions, I know of one or two exceptions where they've never encountered any negativity of this sort, but uh, most people have encountered uh, that sort of negativity. People, uh, I don't want to say violently, I've never encountered any violence, but short of violence, uh, People have, uh, you know, gone to great lengths to try and uh, suppress the findings of parapsychology and, and to suppress individuals working in the field of parapsychology. I didn't realize how serious it was, but now I know. I, I mean, for example, J.B. Ryan, who founded Modern American Parapsychology in the 1930s at Duke University, sought psychiatric help in order for him to deal with the stress he was facing from uh, critics who uh, accused him of all sorts of fraud and, uh, uh, well, fraud, basically, being, you know, one one of the very worst accusations you can ever throw at a scientist. So Ryan not only had to face people accusing him of fraud, he had to face, on occasion, people who were working for him who were engaged in actual fraud. And uh, he, he did that in, in the most open, honest, forthright manner you could. He uh, dismissed those people and he uh, published the fact that they had been caught engaging in fraud and that none of their previous research could therefore be relied upon. He was very explicit in the rare instances in which that happened. But the truth is that whatever field you're in, you're going to have to encounter the um, human nature. And, and human nature is extraordinarily vast and and complex, and it definitely has a, a dark side. Is there a collective Freudian impulse that shrouds the truth, presuming we are all interconnected? And what about in the opposite direction? Is there an impulse for us to want to believe that we're all connected, perhaps even more so than we are? You know, I've often thought of it that way. Uh, Freud made a point of saying that we don't want to know what's in our own mind. The whole notion of the Freudian subconscious is um, uh, based on the idea that we have many impulses, particularly erotic impulses and aggressive impulses, that are not socially acceptable. Um, he explained this very clearly in his book, Civilization and Its Discontents. We, we made a trade-off. We become civilized. We have all the benefits of civilization, but it means we have to suppress and deny certain aspects of our own nature. And that the, becomes the Freudian unconscious. And then Jung took it a step further and he said, yeah, we don't want to know about our spiritual nature either. So the Jungian collective unconscious is filled with aspects of our own spirituality that we don't want to know about. And so the very idea that another person could read your mind, that could know the things about you that you don't even want to acknowledge about yourself, that's very frightening. That's very intimidating to people. And as a culture, if we were to allow uh, uh, human beings on this planet to develop their full psychic potentials, if, for example, all young children who showed psychic promise as children were given the same support and encouragement, uh, that would have an athletic ability or mathematical ability or artistic ability in our culture so that we developed a culture full of psychic individuals. How would that threaten people who don't want to be in such a culture because they don't want to be seen 
by everyone, that they want to keep their privacy. They want to be able to hide uh, from uh, people with regard to their aggressive thoughts, their sexual thoughts that are not permissible, uh, or even behaviors. I think, uh, did I tell you already at the time I interviewed, or uh, it wasn't an interview, it was an occasion on which Arthur C. Clarke, the great science fiction writer, spoke at the Berkeley campus. It was a time when uh, he had just published an article in Time Magazine debunking the claims of Uri Geller that had also been reported in Nature uh, at that time, the early research with, with Geller. And Arthur Clarke didn't want any uh, part of it. He didn't believe it could be real. And so uh, he spoke on the Berkeley campus. And after his talk, I raised my hand and said, Mr. Clark, do you believe in ESP? And his answer was so revealing. He said, no, I do not believe in ESP because I don't want anybody to read my mind. And think of it, it seems absurd, of course, you know, just because you disbelieve doesn't mean someone can't read your mind. But at a cultural level, there's something to that. You can suppress people's psychic abilities by creating a culture in which it's considered unreal, in which people are punished for even thinking about it, and in which there's no support or very limited support or encouragement for people who show talent. So if nobody believes that it's really possible, then fewer and fewer people are going to cultivate that ability, and you're at less risk that some talented psychic is going to come along and discover your hidden secrets. It seems that most spiritual paths require going through some dark night. Why is that? Well, I, I would agree with you that uh, we avoid confronting our own dark side. And yet in spiritual traditions, the tradition, the Western Occidental tradition of initiation, which uh, the Austrian mystic Rudolf Steiner wrote about, quite a, he said, when you become initiated into a spiritual tradition, there's always the guardian of the threshold that you have to encounter. And the guardian of the threshold can be the most ugly, evil-looking being that you've ever known in your life. Another uh, example of this is the phrase, there are demons guarding every temple. Uh, and you'll see this even in the great cathedrals. There are gargoyles uh, all around the, the great cathedrals uh, that are demonic. Uh, looking. And in Asia, it's very explicit, big demonic statues in, in front of the Buddhist temples. They are considered servants of the Buddha, but they scare away the uninitiated, the people who aren't ready. You have to ultimately confront your own darkness, your own shadow, your own demon, so to speak. Uh, it's very explicit, for example, in the step program, people who are overcoming addictions, where they say you have to take a, a, a hard, uncompromising look at yourself, and then you have to begin to make amends for all the uh, things that you've done as a result of that. And people see the 12-step program as a very authentic spiritual path. And, and of course, they're forced into it because, uh, you know, they've hit bottom, so to speak, because of their addictions. And now they're they're working to overcome their addictions and using the power of, of the spirit to overcome addictions. And there's a, a lot of research suggesting that this is an approach that works. Even in the Bible, angels are often depicted as alarming and horrifying Terence McKenna mentioned that we're so estranged that we don't recognize our inner selves when we encounter them. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, Terence made a, a beautiful comment that uh, we are so alienated from ourselves that when we see who we are in our own depths, we think it's an extraterrestrial. How should we distinguish between the monad, the spirit, and the soul? Well, words like spirit, soul, monad, psyche, uh, in Hebrew, the nefesh, the breath, 
uh, or pneuma in, in Greek, are all context dependent. They're, de they're dependent on how they're being used by a person who intends to use them. Uh, the word monad, for example, was largely popularized in, in the writings of uh, the 18th century philosopher uh, Wilhelm Gottfried Leibniz. The, or, or was he 17th century? I'm not even sure uh, at, at this point. But uh, one of the things Arthur Young, my mentor, made a big point of distinguishing between is the notion uh, of, of the difference between the spirit and the soul. Uh, and I find that a very useful distinction that's often glossed over. People talk about the soul as if, for example, it's infinite. They talk about the soul as if it's eternal. That you have an eternal soul. Well, I think of the spirit as being the, that infinite, eternal part of us. And I think it's the depth within each of us. And, and the irony is, uh, well... It's not so ironical to the ancient Hindus who understood that the Atman, that was their word for the essence of the individual. They said the Atman is the same as Brahman. The essence of who you are is the same as the essence of the whole universe. And uh, I like that idea. But that is a reference to what I would call the spirit. And Arthur Young meant that very precisely as spirit, he, which he acquainted or equated with light itself. And, and light, if you know anything about uh, uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, you know that a beam of light can travel the length of the universe. And, and while we're sitting on Earth and watching it, it might take 13 billion years to go or longer to go from one end of the universe to the other. But if you are on a beam of light and you have a wristwatch, time would stand still. So from the perspective of the beam of light, you can travel the whole universe in no time at all, instantly, from your point of view. It's one, one of the paradoxes of time itself. But the, the point I'm trying to make here is that there is this part of us that's infinite and eternal. Now, is that the same part of us that goes from lifetime to lifetime uh, in reincarnation that progresses? I'm not so sure. I think that it's very likely that the soul uh, might last a long time. It might last for thousands of lifetimes. But at some point in the evolution of the soul, we merge to become ultimately where we came from ultimately from our source, which is uh, one with everything. And we may discover that that everything we're one with is completely outside of time and space, that our notion of time and space, as it seems to us while we're here in the body, is what the Hindus call maya. It's something of an illusion. It's not what we think it is. But uh, ultimately, uh, we have that within us, and we have uh, something else within us, which is very long lasting, which is uh, goes well beyond the length of an individual lifetime. But it's, and I would call it the soul. It's our passions, our desires, our what moves us, uh, and and what moves us from lifetime to lifetime. But at some point, we let go of that completely and become just one with pure spirit. So that's how I see it. What are the main organizations currently studying parapsychology? Well, the main organization of uh, parapsychology is the Parapsychological Association. It is an affiliate organization of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. It was originally founded in I think the 1950s by J.B. Ryan and his colleagues at Duke University. Um, it became formally affiliated with the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, in 1969. Uh, it's got about 400 members. 
So that's the major scientific body. But there are others. There is the Society for Scientific Exploration. It publishes a journal of scientific exploration. And it was founded, if I remember correctly, I think in the 1970s, by researchers who were studying the paranormal, but parapsychologists are very explicit. They want to study extrasensory perception and psychosis, basically. Some the question of life after death. But there are other areas of the paranormal, UFOs, crypto, zoology, the study of, for example, Bigfoot and other uh, beings that seem to pass back and forth between different dimensions, uh, the study of orbs, the study of angels, demons. Uh, Those are all areas that could be submitted to scientific inquiry and time travel might be yet another. Uh, And so the Society for Scientific Exploration was formed as, as a way of including all of these fringe areas of science under one umbrella. And and it's a very useful organization. There's also in England in particular, the, uh, although it's an international organization, the Society for Psychical Research, the SPR, was founded in 1882 and really initiated the scientific study of the paranormal. It's been publishing journals and proceedings ever since. So in that organization alone, we have 140 plus years of research data, a very valuable organization, a very important organization. Uh, Of course, all of these organizations operate in concert with each other. And uh, there's a lot of overlap. Sometimes they hold conventions together. There is also the International Association for Remote Viewing, which is now, or IRVA, I-R-V-A, International Remote Viewing Association, is mostly for practitioners of remote viewing, but also researchers. Uh, In addition, there's the International Association for Near-Death studies. Uh, Once again, mostly experiencers, people who have had the near-death experience, but also researchers are involved. Uh, In addition, there are several organizations devoted to the study of consciousness itself. And uh, many of them started out with the idea that Well, we're basically neurology. If you want to study consciousness, you study the brain and the nervous system. But more and more, they've come to realize you can't exclude the paranormal. It just comes up too often over and over again. So many of the organizations devoted to the scientific study of consciousness are now also including uh, parapsychology uh, researchers in uh, their presentations and their conventions and so on. Do you believe the government is still conducting remote viewing research? To me, it's not strange because they investigate almost anything that may pay off, so I don't see it as an endorsement personally. What are your views? Well, we know that the government is now launched uh, some new official programs to look into UFOs or what they are calling UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, which could include orbs, uh, which could include angels, for all I know, uh, or even ghosts. Uh, uh, so there, there is some funding coming through uh, for that. And uh, there was recently the OSAP program that was run by the uh, Bigelow uh, Aerospace Corporation that uh, looked at, looked into all of that. And I think OSAP is no longer in existence. Um, the Bigelow has now established the uh, Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies, but that, that's not receiving, to my knowledge, any government funding. We do know that the government funded remote viewing programs at SRI International and later on at uh, SAIC, Science Applications International Corporation. So for 20 years, uh, that funding 
uh, occurred um, at a, a low level, maybe a million dollars a year, uh, which is not a lot uh, in scientific funding. Supposedly that stopped long ago, basically, I think 1996 or so. Uh, and we don't hear about any more government funding of parapsychology since then. Now, in my opinion, the government would be very smart if they wanted to continue to fund such programs to do it secretly, because the programs are still so controversial that funding them publicly would just generate all sorts of noise and media attention that would not be beneficial to the actual research. So I hope that there is a secret program uh, within uh, not just our government, but other governments as, as well. Uh, I have no knowledge that that is happening. Uh, however, what's pretty clear to me is that all across the spectrum of governments and, and military organizations, there are individuals, often highly placed individuals who have a personal interest and who have certain amount of uh, latitude in their organizations that they they can pursue uh, quietly those interests because they might Im develop into something useful. So I think that there probably, I would guess there are a thousand people like that embedded in different government uh, and scientific organizations around the world who are pursuing this uh, at a personal level. Uh, however, uh, to, to move beyond the personal level to get an actual budget specified for this research is, is another bigger step. And uh, I'm just not aware of that. Are you planning to continue your research with the Bigelow Institute? Have they reached out to you? Well, I, we're always on the lookout for white crows, and uh, I think the Bigelow Institute, uh, one thing you can say about it, it is potentially very well funded. It potentially has a real future. Uh, we're certainly thinking in terms of uh, long-term research projects, uh, but I can't be more specific than that. Are you familiar with Linda Moulton Howe's work? I, I'm aware of her work. I don't know her personally, and uh, I would like to know uh, more about her personal work, actually. Um, I think that uh, she's an example of how far an individual can go to explore a topic which was uh, about as uh, bizarre as anything that anybody has ever looked at. Uh, and, and she's come up, to my knowledge, with, with a lot of data about it, but not any really hard conclusions. Uh, yes, so I think... Uh, uh, I'm an example as well uh, in terms of what an individual can do without a great deal of outside funding. Uh, I, and in fact, the whole New Thinking Aloud channel, what we're doing today, publishing a magazine, a weekly newsletter, a book series, and putting up uh, at, at many videos every week, uh, it's all volunteer effort. Uh, enabling this. We don't have a large budget of, of any sort. Uh, so I'm a strong believer in, in what individuals can do on their own and what volunteers can do without big budgets. In fact, sometimes I, having a big budget gets in the way of, of accomplishing. Of course, not always. Sometimes you can't do things without a big budget, but it's amazing how much you can do uh, just by people who are uh, dedicated and are, are willing to uh, devote their lives to this work. I had no idea that your channel is run entirely by volunteers. That's commendable, man. Absolutely. That's uh, all that we do at New Thinking Aloud. Uh, is, uh, let me put it this way. It's 95% all volunteer effort. When I, I hope to be able to uh, pay people occasionally when uh, we had uh, a book about to be published uh, called Is There Life After Death? And so we'll be having royalty income coming in that will be distributed amongst the volunteers who have worked to make that book possible. You know, 
the volunteers hopefully will be getting something back for all the time and effort they've put in. They're working like professionals, but they're doing it because they love what they do. And uh, that's that's the way great things get done in my mind. What's a peak in Darien experience? Uh, yes, uh, it, the idea of a peak in Darien comes from a poem written, uh, I don't know, years or more ago by John Keat. An uh, episode took place in uh, the early days of, of, of the great explorers, Cortez, I think could be what, 15th, 16th century, uh, when he discovered Panama. Darien is a province in the country of Panama. And when Cortez and his men uh, arrived uh, at that province, they, they saw a mountain. So they climbed the mountain. When they got to the top of the mountain, what did they see to their surprise but the Pacific Ocean? They had no idea it was even there. So a peak in Darien experience has come to mean when you are unexpectedly surprised by something you didn't believe would be there. And in particular, it refers to deathbed visions uh, in which typically people who are dying experience their loved ones waiting to greet them in the afterlife. It's very commonly reported. But on occasion, they report, wait, there's my cousin John. Why is he there to greet me? He's not dead. But then it turns out to be the case that Cousin John actually had died unbeknownst to the person who, who was having the vision. So there are many examples of this where people have, uh, they're having visions related to the afterlife because they're dying or they've had a near-death experience and they've been in the afterlife and they come back and they say, huh, this person was in my uh, near-death experience, but they're not dead. I wonder how, how they got there. And then we learn, oh, they were dead. So uh, those experiences are very important because they help us to overcome the skeptical critique that, well, a person who is, is dying uh, would expect to see their relatives and friends coming to greet them. That's sort of cultural. So uh, it doesn't count as evidence for uh, survival. But if they see someone they didn't expect or they didn't know uh, would be dead, but who they we later learn really was dead, that, that would count as a little piece of evidence pointing towards the existence of a very ontologically real afterlife. How are you planning for the channel to continue, man? And how are you personally preparing for death? Jeff? Well, my basic rule of thumb is to be here and now. Ram Dass put it beautifully yeah, in his book, Be Here Now. We have a series on the uh, New Thinking Aloud channel, a series of my monologues. They're called In Presence, which is my way of saying here and now. Uh, so I'm not really concerned a lot about the future. I'm really much more concerned with the present, about what we're already doing. We're already publishing a weekly newsletter, a quarterly magazine, many interviews a week, including monologues that I do, where they're really dialogues with myself these days. And we're, uh, we have a book series. As, as well. The first volume is about to be published. Uh, it's already pre, uh, you can order advanced copies now on Amazon. Is there life after death? The first volume in the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues series. So I'm just attending to those things and uh, taking it as, as a here and now experience, being with you in the here and now for example. If I can do that well, that'll be enough for me. Could you share a few book recommendations? Uh, a really good book that I uh, encourage people to read who feel they're on the path is uh, one written by the Austrian mystic Rudolf Steiner called Knowledge of the Higher Worlds and Its Attainment. 
I think I think that's a very good book for people. Uh, I encourage people to make it a point to read hundreds of books. We offer a book recommendation every week in in our newsletter, and uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we are reaching out to a community of people who don't want to say that their knowledge of esoteric and paranormal matters is limited to one book, but the, they're willing to read hundreds. That's how you really immerse yourself in, in this area. All right. What are your hopes for the future? And again, thank you so much, man, for coming on the podcast. Well, I imagine that the human race, as a, as a species, that we are capable of uh, expanding our uh, psychic capacities. The, we, you see people occasionally, the Ted Owens and the Uri Gellers and the Ingo Swans and uh, many other highly talented uh, psychic people in, in the world. I see them as exemplars of, of what could be uh, the masses of people. And uh, I can imagine a time in the in, in the distant future, I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. That where where young people everywhere who exhibit some level of interest and talent in this field will be encouraged. We could have a psychic Olympics the way we have a, an Olympics uh, for other endeavors, and uh, I think it would be a good thing overall. But it will require a different kind of humanity. A humanity where all people are willing to acknowledge the spiritual side of life. A humanity in which uh, people don't see themselves, as they often do today, as nothing more than a machine made out of meat. The podcast is now concluded. Thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed or clicked that like button, now would be a great time to do so, as each subscribe and like helps you to push this content to more people. You should also know that there's a remarkably active Discord and subreddit for Theories of Everything where people explicate toes, disagree respectfully about theories, and build as a community our own toes. Links to both are in the description. Also, I recently found out that external links count plenty toward the algorithm, which means that when you share on Twitter, on Facebook, on Reddit, etc., it shows YouTube that people are talking about this outside of YouTube, which in turn greatly aids the distribution on YouTube as well. Last but not least, you should know that this podcast is on iTunes, it's on Spotify, it's on every one of the audio platforms. Just type in Theories of Everything and you'll find it. Often I gain from re-watching lectures and podcasts, and I read that in the comments, hey, Toll listeners also gain from replaying. So how about instead re-listening on those platforms? iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whichever podcast catcher you use. If you'd like to support more conversations like this, then do consider visiting patreon.com slash Kurt Jimungle and donating with whatever you like. Again, it's support from the sponsors and you that allow me to work on Toe full time. You get early access to ad free audio episodes there as well. For instance, this episode was released a few days earlier. Every dollar helps far more than you think. Either way, your viewership is generosity enough.